Um, so we'll go ahead and call the meeting to order. This is the May 5th meeting of the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. And we will start our meeting with a roll call. Uh, Commissioner Bertrand. Uh, present. Commissioner Sandy Brown. Uh, present. Commissioner Johnson. Here. Commissioner Alternate Hurst. Here. Commissioner Caput. Here. Commission Alternate Schifrin. Here. Uh, Commissioner uh, Alternate Quinn. I don't see him just yet. Commissioner Koenig. Here. Commissioner McPherson. Here. Commissioner Kristen Brown. Present. Commissioner Parker. Here. Commissioner Rotkin. You're on mute, Commissioner Rocket. Sorry, here. Sorry. And and uh, Commissioner Olenek from Caltrans. Here, thank you. Okay. We will now move on to oral communications. Oral communications is a time for members of the public to address the commission on items uh, that are not on today's agenda. And the commission will listen to all communications, uh, but in compliance with state law, will not take action on items that are not on today's agenda. Uh, you can, if you're on your phone, you can uh, raise your hand by pressing star nine. And, or if you're on Zoom via the uh, raise hand button on your Zoom controls. And uh, speakers are requested to state their name clearly so that it can be accurately recorded in the minutes of the meeting. So I will go ahead and start with um, David dislikes bullies. You are our first caller. And uh, so we'll uh, call on you, you're up. And if you're muted, you can press uh, star six to unmute. David is like <laughs> uh, uh, Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, this is uh, David Van Brink. And I have a, a note about the agenda packet. There were some 440 plus emails that are currently being added to the agenda packet as they were uh, inadvertently spammed. Uh, Yesenia and Krista, Krista are looking at that as I understand. So um, thank you for your help. These are uh, all from four advocates and pertain to item 28 favoring ultimate trail. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Van Brink. Uh, next up, we have Brian from Trail Now. Hi, this is Brian from Trail Now. Thank you. Uh, we're a local organization working to move forward with the Santa Cruz Coastal Trail now in a timely and effective manner. I personally have been involved in state and Santa Cruz transportation for over 20 years regularly participating in the RTC meetings for over a decade. Um, you know, many of you know that I was in a serious accident a month ago, broke my neck, broke my back, fractured nine ribs and bruised my ribs. I'm doing well. And thank you all for the well wishes. Uh, many of you were probably very surprised that I actually called in to the RTC meeting a few days after my accident from the ICU. I felt that it was important to call into the meeting to express the importance that our community move forward with building the coastal trail in a timely and cost-effective manner. What really drove me to call in was the 12-year-old boy who was in the room next door. He had been hit on his bike by a car and was in critical conditions. This is very upsetting. This made me upset with Santa Cruz transportation policy and politics, the decade long delay building a cost-effective coastal trail. People are dying, people are getting injured on the county roads. Every day cyclists and pedestrians are at risk without having safe transportation corridor across the county. As elected officials on the RTC board, you have the responsibility to move forward with timely and cost-effective infrastructure investments. Please do not continue to play the political games. 
listen to the RTC staff and transportation experts on the facts. Very much appreciate your time. And I am actually walking, grateful to be walking and alive. And wear a helmet, everybody, when you ride your bike. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peoples. Uh, we, our next caller is uh, Rick Longinati. And Mr. Longinati, if you are muted, you can unmute yourself on your Zoom controls or with star six. Okay, Mr. Longinati is, seems to have disappeared from my participant's screen. So uh, we'll get you back in the queue uh, and we'll call, I'll call on Salad and Sale next. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Thank you. My name is Saladin Sale. All items appearing on the consent agenda are represented as being minor or non-controversial. It is hard for me to understand how a staff recommendation to abandon efforts to secure a contract to repair our county's bridge link Mr. to the national rail. Mr. Sale, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, I, we do want to hear your comments. Uh, that is an item on our consent agenda and that uh, I'm intending to pull that item. So you will get an opportunity to speak about it. When we get to that, we're, we're um, still on oral communications. So Thank item you. Not that, was, that, that was going to be Sorry my request that. Yeah. to pull the item. That was going to be my request to pull the item. Thank you. Gotcha. Okay, we will do. Um, thank you. Uh, Mr. Scott, Barry Scott, you're up next. Good morning, uh, Chair Brown and Commissioners. I am, I'm not going to address item 28. I've got something else I wanted to mention that's not on the agenda. And uh, it, it's inspired by a, a presentation I gave to 40 people, I think, at La Selva Beach. Um, and I was just sharing with them the, the trail master plan uh, details and I'd made copies for them and showed slides. But the reason I'm calling, they asked about the, the um, you know, the washout repair and the erosion repair and what was going on with that. And, uh, and, I, and I said that it was probably a technicality that needed to be cured uh, before they could do the, the full amount of uh, work that's needed. And uh, through an email that I think arrived yesterday, we, we understand that the RTC, according to the Coastal Commission needs to obtain a coastal development permit, but the RT thing, RTC thinks that they may, they might not need that, uh, and we'll do a temporary repair. And I just want to encourage and speak, I think, on behalf of all the La Silva residents who were there, that they really, uh, and I certainly, I think a lot of the community hope that you iron out the problems and are able to do the full work that's needed for uh, that, uh, that section to preserve the tracks, no matter what we do with the corridor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Our next caller is uh, has a number ending in 7780. And it looks like you're on mute. You can press star six to unmute yourself. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? This is Craig Chatterton. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Yes, I would like to bring a study to the attention of the commission. Uh, there was a study in Southern California funded by Caltrans. By, it was for the Inland Empire region. And the purpose was to study the impact of broadband adoption on vehicle miles traveled and also greenhouse gases. I put a slide in for this. I don't know if it's being shown. But I did include a slide which showed the cover page of the study and the URL for it. And I would ask that the commission consider asking the RTC staff to review this study and determine if the approach and or results might be relevant to Santa Cruz County. As a point of reference, uh, the LPA, the locally preferred alternative, which was presented last April, had a greenhouse gas reduction of about, point, about 0 0.16%. 
This study in Southern California showed a greenhouse gas reduction of from 1 to 15 percent, depending upon what approach they took and what adoption levels they were able to achieve. So that could be a 10x or more improvement versus a solution like rail in the corridor. And recall the goals of the LTA were the triple bottom line assessments of economic equity and environmental impacts. And broadband, as they just discovered, is really a green strategy and could be a very important part of reducing vehicle miles traveled and greenhouse gases here in Santa Cruz County. So I think this is worth evaluating. I would just ask the commission to consider that. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. And uh, we didn't have the slide up during your uh, comments, but if we could, uh, if it came into the commission office, if that could be distributed to commissioners, I, it may be in our inbox. I, have, I will say uh, the first speaker mentioned a significant number of emails that have come in and I have received those and I've heard from other commissioners that they too have received those. So our, our boxes are, are pretty full. Um, so if we, if we could get that slide um, referencing the study, it would be very helpful. Uh, thanks, just for staff. Um, okay, next up we have Michael Saint. Uh, thank you, Chair Brown. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, Michael Saint with Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. Um, when it comes to climate change, most citizens and politicians have their blinders on, only focusing on their small immediate problems and ignoring what's happening around the world. As climate impacts worsen, scaling up investments in climate resilience will be essential for survival. We need to divest from the fossil fuels and get out of our cars, period. So far, this RTC's UCI studies, alternative studies for train rail, the potential loss of rail on the corridor, the highway widening with non-functioning bus and traffic will lead to a large net increase in greenhouse gas emissions as well as vehicle miles travel. To me personally, and to a lot of our advocates, this is extremely sad. Uh, with all the studies that's been going on for 10 years, there will be no help in mitigating climate change. The effects of climate change will actually have contributed to global warming through the RTC projects. At some point in this time, those that make these decisions about our transportation infrastructure have to wake up and realize the only way to fix our and be part of the answer to mitigating climate change at the same time is to get people out of their cars. Here are a few comments I've heard over the years from commissioners and RTC directors. It's about time we say no to cars. We know the Ox Lane project won't work. We need to move people, not cars. The answer to our future congestion is a return to mass transit no ifs, ands, or buts. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Saint. Our next caller is Barbara Chamberlain. And Barbara, you are on mute. There we go. Here I am. My name is Barbara Chamberlain. I am the president of the Cabrillo Host Lions Club and uh, past district governor of Lions District. 4C6. As you know, the Lions have a great uh, need for helping handicapped people, elderly people, and low-income people. This is, this is one of our goals, and I would urge the commissioners to do some significant future planning for helping this group and also for decongesting the highway and there's only one way to do that, and that is with alternate transportation. And there's a, a lot of um, things going on right now with um, different types of trains and a significant uh, help for these, this group, this is large group, is to make sure that there is a way in the future, maybe it might take a long time, I realize that, and I may never see it, but the, um, future would be to have some sort of connection by rail from Watsonville to uh, maybe Santa Clara, go to the airport, things like that. Um, 
there is a significant need for that right here in the county. Any new improvements to the highway would only add to the congestion. And I do feel very sorry for people who are stuck in the commute traffic right now. I think the, the commissioners could with significant and innovative future planning help this group of people and also help the workers of this county who have to drive over to San Jose every day. Thank you very much for your help. And if you have any questions, do contact me. Thank you, Ms. Chamberlain. Our next caller is Judy Gittleson. Hi, good morning, Chair Brown and commissioners. I'm a fortunate Watsonville resident and a, and a staunch, um, staunch train supporter. But today I want to invite you to, I'm an artist and I want to invite you to my gallery on Main Street, 430 Main Street, to see my show that's up through the middle of June called Welcome Aboard. And it's uh, showcasing the history of the Pajaro Valley and the importance and usefulness of train in the Santa Cruz County. It's been a force for good. And I really want to encourage all of you to support the train and to fix the tracks and public transportation. In Watsonville, we could really use a very um, good rail system to connect our people with the world and to bring the world to Watsonville too. So I welcome you to come to Studio Judy G in Watsonville. Thank you for your work. Thank you, Ms. Gittleson. Our next caller is Robin Belkin. And it looks like you are muted. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, this is Robin Belkin. I've lived here for the last 30 years consecutively, and I also went to UCSC coming from Southern California where I wanted to get away from all the congestion. I would just like to say also as a trained coach that in terms of making decisions, it's always helpful to stay focused on your mission and your purpose. And my understanding of your mission and your purpose is to work towards sustainable multimodal transportation and uh, improving the quality of life for those that live here. And I understand that greenhouse gas emissions and traffic congestion and global warming are all critical to that end. So in terms of the ultimate versus interim trail, I strongly urge you to support the ultimate trail. And from what I can tell, you've already chosen that based on all the exhaustive studies you've done. And I hate to see you lose focus on your mission and on the work you've already done, which I thank you for. I Ms. understand. Ms. Belkin, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, the question of interim versus ultimate trail configuration is on our agenda today. Um, so we you will have an opportunity to speak about that during that item, uh, which is uh, scheduled for 1030 AM. Oh, I'm sorry. So wrong time. So, so yeah, if this is for items not on the agenda, general okay. comments. Uh, so item 11 pulling from the agenda, does that qualify? We will be doing that um, right after oral communications. Okay, my apologies. That. Thank you. No, no problem. Hear from me again. Bye. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, our, our next caller is Tina Andreata. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good morning. Hi. Um, I would like to. I would like to read this. California Transportation Commissioner James Gelametti quoted in the Santa Cruz Sentinel on July first, twenty ten, regarding the granting of ten point two million to the SCCRTC from Proposition one sixteen funds to purchase the Santa Cruz Branch Line Rail Corridor and the right of way from Union Pacific. Here's his quote. 
Proposition 116 was meant for rail, not for bicycle trails and paths. I don't want a bait and switch going on to allocate the funds and buy this, only to find out several years later that we don't have a rail project, unquote. And um, let's uh, continue forward with the state rail plan. Let's connect, you know, Santa Cruz County uh, to Capitola, Aptos, La Selva Beach, Watsonville, uh, down to Gilroy and to the rest of the state rail plan. Uh, let's, um, I really think you need to shelve uh, the trail only. I call it the trail to nowhere. Thank you, have a good day. Thank you, Ms. Andreata. Um, Commissioner Rockin. Yeah, I, I can't see how many people are lined up. I just wanna make a comment um, to encourage the chair to say support the chair in making a quicker decision when people call in and are making comments, whatever side they're on, that are really about the item that's on our agenda. I know you're doing your best. It's not, it's not easy to chair these things, but it's pretty clear sometimes after the first three words that a person can't help themselves but talk, talk about our number 28 item. And I would really strongly encourage you to cut them off quickly. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Rockin. It's, I am, uh trying to monitor that it's a it's a little bit challenging to um when when we get we move from the the general comments about rail and trail or i, I would i would just say so at, yeah at, at this point if people are commenting about the virtues of rail and i'm a rail supporter if they're commenting about the virtues of rail it's about item 28 and it, you could feel free to cut them off i think is one so i'm only one commissioner but that'd be my encouragement so well, thank you for raising it, and um, I, hopefully, for for members of the public, you've heard the um, <laughs> the request, and I, I agree. Uh, please do try to uh, make your comments during oral communications about items that are not on the agenda. We do have time, um, and we'll get there uh, probably more quickly if we uh, move through our first items on our business agenda. So I'll um, go ahead next and call on Gina Cole. Uh, and ask you to, again, speak to items not on today's agenda. Okay, it looks like Gina, uh, Ms. Cole has dropped off. Um, so I'll call on Equi Equity Transit next. Hi, thank you commissioners uh, for your time and your work. Um, I just wanna speak on, I, I just came a little bit late. And so someone may have already spoken about missing letters. Um, I know that I myself sent in a letter prior to 9 a.m. yesterday, and I did not see it on the public package. I do wanna say that I appreciate the staff because when I called, they immediately, um, researched this and um, addressed it, and I really appreciate their time and effort to do so. I do want to suggest, however, that we had heard this issue come up in the past, perhaps even as many as 6,000 letters um, from a past um, RTC meeting had gone missing and were not included as a part of the package. The public record is very important and making sure that we um, have a process by which these letters are not being lost in the trash or somewhere else is really important. Um, so I guess some of us are gonna have to do some research to see if our letters made it onto past RTC meeting agendas. And then I just want to also mention that there was a timing change. I mentioned this in a previous RTC meeting. As of December, 2021, on the timing change to submit letters was very concisely noon by the Wednesday prior to the meeting. And then as of December 2021, it changed to a more complex situation where items on the agenda were accepted uh, prior to 9 a.m. Items not on the agenda were a Monday, uh, some weeks prior to the meeting. And that makes it very difficult, especially if we want to ensure that our comments are on a specific agenda. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Faulkner. Uh, we, we did hear about that and uh, our staff will be working to monitor that as we move forward. And, and those, uh, those letters are 
being distributed uh, for this agenda item or for this agenda. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, Rick Longinotti is back. You're up. Mr. Longinotti, we can't hear you if you're speaking. So just make sure you're unmuted. And it looks like you are still, okay. there we go. I, th I, think, uh, I think I just got the cue to unmute. All right. There you go. Thank you, commissioners. Good morning. Um, so my name is Rick Longinotti and I'm with the Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. And uh, tomorrow, there's a lawsuit that we are uh, is being heard in Sacramento Superior Court from uh, that's our, our organization and Sierra Club sued Caltrans over the Highway One EIR. And um, if we just you know can can assume that there may be a ruling in our favor that the EIR is inadequate, I want to talk about what happens next. Um, the uh, our organization has, has a pretty simple ask, and that is that uh, instead of building auxiliary lanes and running buses in those auxiliary lanes where they'll be stuck in traffic, uh, in the peak hour traffic, that we actually put some paint on those lanes and make them exclusively bus only lanes. Um, everywhere else in the country, where there's a uh, bus on shoulder, it refers to bus only lanes. The only segment of the proposed project before you that is bus only is at the interchanges. When you go over an overpass, the bus will have its own short segment all by itself. The rest of the time, uh, the buses will be in mixed with other traffic in auxiliary lanes. And that's not gonna attract a lot of riders to ride the bus because you know, you want a bus only lane where the bus <clears throat> will be able to make time and really attract riders. Um, if you can imagine the future where uh, the Highway 17 Express starts in Watsonville, picks up passengers in Aptos and Soquel and heads over the hill, uh, in addition to uh, the existing service, you imagine the 91X going down the, the highway and making good time. You can really make good time when there's not congestion. And with a bus only lane, uh, the, the express bus could really make good time. And for some people that would. Okay, thank you, Mr. Longinotti. Um, we are, your two minutes are up and uh, you can go ahead and send additional comments if you'd like. And I, I do have messages from you as well. So, um, Thank you for your comments. I'll call next on Gina Cole. Olivia, will you please unmute Ms. Cole and make me co-host? Okay, it looks like we have lost Ms. Cole for the moment. Um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and call on our next speaker, uh, Fern. You're up. And it looks like, so you are, uh, you're currently muted. Fern, if you could un unmute yourself so that we can hear you. Okay, I see that it looks like your name has changed, um, Fern um, Selzer. We, we are still on mute, so we're not able to hear you. You can unmute yourself in the toolbar on your, your Zoom screen.
Okay. So we're not able to hear you and um, I think, and we are on a time schedule. We have a public hearing scheduled for 9.30. So I'm gonna keep us moving along. Um, <clears throat> we'll, before we move on to our public hearing, I do wanna uh, just ask if there are uh, any uh, additions or deletions to today's agenda? Um, so there is one deletion. Um, item 30 is not needed today. That's closed session. Okay. And there are handouts for items 11, 26, and 28, and those have been posted to our website. Um, and I know staff was working on getting the comments that um, unfortunately went into our junk email um, uh, posted. As they are not junk, they are important public um, input. Okay, thank you. We, um, so we are at our item four on our agenda, um, the, the beginning of the consent agenda. So items four through um, 22 are consent items. It, given that we are pulling an item and there may be some comment on the other items and then we have uh, the regular agenda items. Um, I think we right now should um, move item 26 up. We have a public hearing on 2022 unmet transit and paratransit needs. And um, so it, it's amenable to the group. I would um, move that up and begin the public hearing and open that hearing now. Um, and then we will return to the regular agenda and it's in order. So um, we have, so Amanda Marino, our trans a transportation planner at the RTC is going to provide a staff report uh, on the final draft of the 2022 unmet transit and paratransit needs. And then we will take, we'll open the hearing and take public comment. Thank you and good morning. Uh, my name is Amanda Marino and I'm a transportation planner for the RTC and currently staff the Elderly and Disabled Transportation Advisory Committee, END TAC. For the Regional Transportation Commission's consideration is the 2022 final draft unmet transit and paratransit needs list listed as attachment one in your packet with changes since the 2021 unmet needs list shown in underline and strikeout. TDA statutes require that tra transportation planning agencies that use TDA funds for local streets and road projects to implement a public process, including a public hearing, to identify unmet transit needs of transit-dependent or disadvantaged persons and determine if unmet transit needs can reasonably be met. Although the RTC does not allocate TDA funds to local streets and road projects and therefore is not required to perform this analysis, the RTC endeavors to solicit regular input on unmet transit and paratransit needs to provide a useful tool to assess and prioritize needs in the region, as well as identifying needs for future transit funding. Serving as the Social Services Transportation Advisory Council for TDA statutes, the Elderly and Disabled Transportation Advisory Committee, ENDTAC, regularly hears and considers unmet transit and paratransit needs in Santa Cruz County. Unmet transit and paratransit needs are those transportation needs which are not being met by the current public transportation system, have community support, and do not duplicate transit services provided publicly and privately or, or privately. The unmet needs are prioritized using high, medium, and low rankings. High priority items are those items that fill a gap or absence of ongoing service. Medium priority items are those that supplement existing service. Low priority items are still an unmet need, but is assigned low priority because the need identified may be general in nature and requires more specific planning to identify strategies or may not address a basic need such as transportation for medical appointments, shopping or access to other services. When in, within each category, there are three levels indicating what extent the needs, if addressed, would advance regional transportation plan goals, with one being a project that is expected to improve safety, 
economic vitality, and cost effectiveness. The items on the list reflect public input or input from a variety of sources, including members of the public, partner agencies, and is primarily a document worked on by the RTC's e and TAC, which includes Santa Cruz Metro, the Volunteer Center, and the Coordinated Transportation Services Agency, Community Bridges Lift Line staff. The draft 2022 unmet transit and paratransit needs list was posted to the RTC website and a notice availability was sent to interest groups, senior living facilities, senior centers, local jurisdictions, and transportation service providers in Santa Cruz County. English and Spanish, Spanish ads additionally went out in the Centennial and the Pajaronian. Public input was received using the online form available in both English and Spanish, receiving 76 comments included as attachment two. The RTC additionally attended the Pajaro Valley Chamber of Commerce and Agriculture's Business, Business Expo with printed copies of the online form in both English and Spanish. Some of the updates to the unmet needs list from last year include a need to increase bus service near senior living facilities, libraries, and other public venues, ensure accessible public taxi service and rideshare service for those using mobility devices, increasing the need for specialized transportation for areas outside the ADA mandated paratransit service area for medical, non-medical trips, as well as free or low cost paratransit options, including a need for greater frequency and span of transit service in Soquel and on Old San Jose Road, Aptos and Coralitos, consider creating an all night an all-nighter circular bus network providing late night and early morning bus service in downtown areas, improving interregional and cross-county transit services, including connections to the Salinas Intermodal Transportation Center and implementing express bus service using future bus on shoulder operations on Highway 1. There's also a clarifying the need for safe paths, for safe paths of travel at potential future transit stations on the rail line, increasing the need for free or low cost transportation options, including fixed route transit services and a need for earlier and faster frequency of transit trips system-wide, improving sidewalk connectivity and lighting at bus stops, reinstate a bus stop committee to study and monitor bus stop accessibility, at a bus stop at the intersection of Granite Creek Road and Santa's Village Road in Scotts Valley, coordinate improvements of the Watsonville Transit Center's transit facilities and provide increased parking, develop microtransit programs in San Lorenzo Valley, Scotts Valley, Soquel, Aptos, and Watsonville, provide a dedicated park and ride lot near Highway 1 connecting transit service in Watsonville, Increasing the amount of on-bus bike racks to better, better facilitate first last mile of travel and installing bike lockers at transit stations. I additionally received a, a comment from Caltrans District 5 staff yesterday to add a need to install bus stop amenities such as digital bus tracking and information displays, USB charging and Wi-Fi for transit users. You can review these updates and additional updates to the list on the RTC website or in this RTC packet. This unmet needs list is not a funding recommendation and does not prioritize projects for funding in that it does not provide a detailed project schedules or timelines. This list and public process is used as a tool to receive public input and identify projects to be considered in the preparation of both grant applications and for future and for transit operators to use to identify transit needs for future funding opportunities, including RTC discretionary transit funds, such as state transit assistant funds, state of the good repair funds, and low carbon transit operation program funds and more. Staff recommends that the RTC adopt the 2022 unmet transit and paratransit needs list with amendments as appropriate following a public hearing and consider unmet transit and paratransit needs as funding becomes available. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marino. Uh, uh, appreciate your oral presentation and commissioners have reviewed the 
packet, which includes the lists. I want to now open it up for commissioner questions. And uh, bef before we take it out to for public input, and I see Commissioner McPherson. Yes, uh, thank you, Ms. Marino, for a very thorough uh, presentation. Uh, I might be getting ahead of ourselves, but there's the potential for a Kaiser Medical Facility being um, uh, being built over in the, the Live Oak area on Chana Clear, and uh, it's yet to be decided, the finalized. But I just wonder if this is a good time to say if that should happen, we should pay attention to that because. Uh, being a member of Metro as well, it, it really complicates the, the bus route system for Metro. And I don't know how we might be able to, I think it just it should be uh, pointed out that that's going to be a need. And it's, um, it's a difficult situation for Metro to meet if that, should, if that facility should be built. I, uh, I don't know if this is the right time, but to, because it hasn't been uh, constructed yet, but um, I think maybe we should pay some attention to it if it should happen. Uh, one way or the other. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Rotkin. I just have a brief comment. Uh, the public needs to be aware that the number of bicycles that we carry on um, Metro buses is at its maximum right now. Every bus carries, uh, has a capacity to carry uh, three bikes, up to three bikes. And it's not, we used to have the racks on the back, but people had problems with because the driver couldn't see the bikes back there, people stealing bikes. And so we made a decision to move them to the front, but the current technology doesn't allow racks that'll carry more than three bikes, much as all of us would love to have five, or I've often been left behind by a bus holding onto my bicycle. I had to lock my bike up and quickly hop on the bus. But that's just some factual information for people that unfortunately there's just isn't current technology that would allow more than three bikes to a bus. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Bertrand. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I noted in the uh, report uh, many things that were absolutely wonderful and certainly a guide, as you said, for future um, grant applications, uh, the considerations that are far reaching and also affects many other areas, not just seniors. So in, in all, it benefits the whole group around Santa Cruz County. Um, you mentioned something in the report about doing a survey for needs, senior needs and such. I believe the Senior Council does an annual survey of senior needs. Um, is that something that you, um, this agency is working with them, trying to you know, make sure that survey is well uh, distributed and, and proper questions, et cetera? So that's my question. Not at this time. This is a separate survey that we put out for just for the unmet needs list, but that is a really um, great option. And I'll take note of that for next year. Maybe we can integrate our surveys together and work together. Yeah, that, that'd be great because many of the things that are on this list are definitely the things that the Senior Council addresses. Um, you're right. Uh, maybe a slightly different focus, intense focus, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bertrand, and thank you, Ms. Marino. Uh, we do, I'm also on the uh, Area Agency on Aging uh, Board, and we do a comprehensive survey. So I, I'll try to connect you with the uh, staff there to move, do that moving forward. Uh, okay, we have, let's see, um, Mr. Olenek, did I pronounce that right? Yes, thank you, good morning. I just wanted to emphasize the, uh, the importance of this unmet transit needs process. We monitor transit planning and we monitor this process under the statutes of the TDA. And the comment that Amanda offered, I was gonna call on um, Madeline Jacobson of our team, of our, of our transit staff team, to kind of emphasize the importance of um, adding certain features, key implementing key improvements. That are, We're all really trying to move the needle to help shift uh, driver behavior from vehicles to, to things like transit and other sustainable modes. So if it's okay, Madeline, if you wouldn't mind raising your hand real quick and just kind of emphasizing our point about the, the technology. All right. And I believe you can unmute yourself, Ms. Jacobson. Thank you. Oh, excuse me. Thank you, John, and good morning, commissioners. Um, supporting our statewide goals to help bridge those gaps in broadband access 
District 5 would encourage consideration in the unmet needs list an item to install transit amenities such as Wi-Fi for transit users or digital bus tracking and information displays and USB charging when feasible uh, as additional amenities to existing or future transit stops. And so appreciate documentation in the in the unmet needs list of this opportunity to bridge those broadband gaps. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline, and thank you for the time. Uh, she's our District 5 tr transit planner, so Going forward, we're glad to be available to help with any questions. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, uh, Commissioner Quinn. Oh, great, uh, uh, thank you, Chair Brown. A terrific report, and mine's a question regarding, given the um, rapid expansion of the elderly population and the disabled, I'm just curious as to the process to piggyback the paracrews onto uh, existing buses and looping back to uh, Mr. McPherson's comment, there are certain places we know the elderly and the disabled go with alarming regularity. Dominican Hospital, the Sutter Place, the rehab facility uh, over on Frederick. How do we piggyback the individualized transportation onto the existing hubs uh, to try to move as many people as we can? Uh, thank you, Commissioner Quinn, for the question. Can I ask a question? Please. Uh, Robert, I, I, I'm not sure exactly. Robert, could, I'm asking you just to repeat what you said, but I'm trying to understand what, what specifically you're asking for. I haven't uh, quite grasped it. Thank you. Yeah, I, it's a planning. How do we, you know, the a lot of the paracruise is very individualized and it needs to be. People need help getting in and out of the vehicle. But once they're in, the individual vehicles um, are under leveraged. And there are places where they have buses that can handle a numbers of wheelchairs when they're pre scheduled, they know they're going, say, to Dominican or Sutter. And do we have the ability to cluster the rides or leverage larger vehicles to, to scale the individualized transit that paratransit needs? So you're talking about uh, shared use of these vehicles. In, in exactly. Some way, if I understand it. So yeah. you know, I will say that that's already something that we are trying to maximize at the, at the uh, Metro in, at Santa Cruz Metro. And perhaps our staff could give you more detailed response from the from Metro could give you a more detailed uh, description of what we're involved in now and what and you can talk with them and be clear about things you think that are missing in our current operations. Yeah, I'd be happy to educate it offline. It's just it's such a huge uh, issue in terms of leveraging that. Sure, no, I understand your point now. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll have the Metro staff reach out to you um, and we'll talk about what we're doing in that area in terms of our repair. Uh, Oper uh, transit operations. Thank you. Okay, we will now take it out to the public for comments. And the, our first caller is Brian Trail Now. Hey, thanks, Brian Peoples from Trail Now. You know, in 2015, we were a political action committee that opposed Measure B. And what happened was Zach Brandon. Don Lane changed the language to move money from a basically a train and, and a train station in Monterey County to paratransit to Metro. And that was so great. And then what we did is we became a big supporter of Measure D. And all we all know that 2016 Measure D was a game changer for our community. Great, great, great. My mother died last year of ALS. And I'll tell you that the lift line is a phenomenal program. It really needs to be more invested in that. It basically went from point A to point B. They gave a time slot when they would come and pick her up and they would drop her off at her um, doctor's appointment. So that's a phenomenal program. We need to invest more in that kind of point to point service for the ADA requirements. Wi-Fi on bus, definitely need to increase that because you know why? Those people who are riding buses can get paid while they're riding on the bus by employers. Employers, I know this, but my employer does it. They pay you if you're working on a transit bus. If you're on Wi-Fi, you're working, you're engaged, the employer's paying you. So immediately, it's a game changer for them. Digital trans tracking, phenomenal, excellent idea. Let's get more of that so that the Metro users can see when the buses are. If there's a delay, they know it. So let's continue to invest in the digital age. 
appreciate that. So thanks again for your time and we advocate for more Metro dollars. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peoples. Uh, let's see, I will call on, it looks like, or I'm, I'm gonna try to keep these in order here. Um, and so I'm gonna call next on Jessica for ultimate rail and trail. And this is for unmet paratransit needs comments. Hi, Chair. I'm sorry, I didn't realize my hand was up. No need for me to oh, comment at this time. Okay. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Um, okay, so next up, we'll, I'll call on Michael Saint. Uh, thank you, Chair Brown. Just a couple of quick comments. Um, I totally agree with all those things that the presenter presented. Um, if we are going to increase uh, that type of travel, of course, vehicle miles travel uh, increases, I would highly recommend that we either put a, someone involved in this issue um, and have them follow up to make sure that we can try to get electric uh, type vehicles to do this extra driving, um, mainly for greenhouse gas reductions. Also, is it possible um, that we stop using the term bus on shoulder? very misleading as it is with the ox lane project. Uh, I mean, we might as well call the ox lane project cars on shoulder because it's basically mixed in with the bus. So be nice to just take that term out of there because when you do use it, it really isn't meaning what you say. So just would appreciate that. And I hope this program works out well and we actually do help a lot of the handicapped and those less fortunate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Saints. Our next caller is Barbara Chamberlain. Coming. <laughs> Hello, I wanted to comment on the um, taking elderly and people who are needing uh, treatment to appointments. And it's a massive job because every person has a different time appointment at the um, hospital or at a facility where they're going to do tests. So you may have a, a real problem there with transporting uh, a lot of people at once because they all have a different time appointment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Chamberlain. So it looks like we have one more caller, uh, Linda Wilshusen. It's your turn. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Linda Wilshusen. Um, I'm really, uh, every year, enjoy looking at this list because it just demonstrates how many things we can do to improve our transit system. I know that this process is kind of treated like an annual formality, but it really should be much more than that. The transit and paratransit needs list is a long and important summary of how improved transit service for all of us can help the many people in our county who don't drive, but also those of us who are tired of sitting in traffic and want other options. The RTC staff um, it does a great job on this list with the Elderly and Disabled Advisory Committee, but it's, you know, it's not just for disabled and elderly. And I hope they take a close look at this list throughout the year to make and recommend meaningful improvements to our current and future public transportation network. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wilshusen. All right, this is a uh, last call. Losing Sandy. Chair, sure. we froze for a moment. Um, we didn't hear what you last said. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't, I don't see any additional hands up. Uh, and so we'll bring it back to the commission for 
deliberation and action. Apologies if my Wi-Fi is unstable. Um, I see, okay, uh, Commissioner Rotkin. I'll move the staff recommendation that had that the uh, broadband issues that were raised by the state person from the state who spoke uh, be added to that list. Second. Third. <laughs> All right, we have a motion and a second to um, uh, add, to adopt the um, unmet paratransit needs list with the additions from Caltrans uh, discussion. I see uh, Commissioner Johnson, uh, Randy Johnson, you're up. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to echo um, what um, Brian People said about his mother. I. I had a similar situation with mine. She was 95, um, legally blind. Uh, there were occasions when she felt the need to jump on a public bus, which was closer right in Watsonville off of Green Valley Road, and go to the mall. And we'd say, Mom, what are you doing? And she had to go to Kohl's to get an outfit or what have you. But that aside, you know, the regular bus systems, trains or whatever, don't really service the elderly. It's always paratransit, okay? Those are the ones that are kind of the door-to-door -door where you make the appointments. They bring you from the doorstep to the doctors. They will schedule it and bring you right back. And that, along with other means of having those types of systems and enhancing them, are is what going to serve the elderly in this in this county. So I just wanted to to the extent that we can enhance those things and make them better, I think will serve the elderly tremendously. So thank you, Chair, for, for allowing me. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Commissioner Bertrand. Well, thank you very much, Chair. And following Randy's comments, and I know what Randy has gone through recently, and um, I, I totally understand his perspective because uh, we did the same with our family. Uh, we took care of our mom at home, but for her on her own and feel that independence was very important for her. And I think for many people to still have a sense of independence, that they're, that they're able to take care of things and make their own decisions and act on them is very important. And getting to medical appointments, which could change at a moment's notice, <laughs> which often it happens when you're elderly, uh, people just don't realize that. To have an independent way to get back and forth is really critical. So um, totally supporting of this motion and totally supporting of the efforts to document unmet needs. And, you know, uh, my hat's off to Metro and as mentioned by several others, uh, the uh, Measure D has had a lot to do with making these services available to seniors in our county, and we're very lucky for it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bertram. Commissioner Ratkin. I just wanted to clarify that in my addition to the staff recommendation that I'll leave it to staff to uh, score the, the uh, broadband issue. It, it's obviously not, um, a, I wouldn't describe it as a gap. It's an addition to what we currently do, and they let them give it the exact ratings that it needs in terms of how it gets added to the, to the list that we're, we're producing here. Thank you, Commissioner Rockin. Uh, does that work for the second of on the motion? Yes. All right. Uh, so I don't see any other hands up. I'll just make a quick comment and say uh, thank you to members of the public who showed up to comment today. Thank you to all of the commenters in this uh, in the survey. Uh, we we got some really good. Uh, um, comments and suggestions, and uh, many thanks to our staff for pulling this all together. Uh, I, you know, we we have been in an age of austerity around public transit. I mean, decades and decades and decades of underinvestment. Uh, we see that uh, the list is still long. We have made progress in large part due to. Uh, Measure D and thank the voters for that as always, um, but the needs are are significant and, and those individualized uh, transit options for uh, people in need is is critical. And so this 
does provide us with uh, kind of a blueprint for how to prioritize in moving forward. Uh, and um, so I will, um, I'm happy to support this motion. And I think with that, we can call for uh, a roll call vote on the motion. Commissioner Bertrand? I agree. Commissioner Sandy Brown? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Aye. Commissioner Alternate Hearst? Aye. Commissioner Caput? Aye. Commission Alternate Schifrin? Aye. Commission Alternate Quinn? Yes. Commissioner Koenig? Aye. Commissioner McPherson? Yes. Commissioner Kristen Brown? Aye. Commissioner Parker? He said aye with me. Aye. <laughs> and Commissioner Rockin? Aye. That passes unanimously. All right. Thank you, everyone. So we'll now return to our consent agenda. This, uh, um, Commissioner McPherson, did you want to make a comment before we? Oh, I was going to just, you know, if we go to it, I wanted okay. to make a comment. Okay, gotcha. Um, so, so the consent agenda uh, includes items four through 22 on uh, today's agenda. And um, so we will uh, vote on all of these items at once. We will take comments from the public on these items uh, all at once, unless uh, commissioners and or members of the public would like to pull an item. And I have already said I would pull item 11. So that is that is the approval um, or rejection of a bid for the Pajaro River Bridge Rehabilitation Project. So we'll um, pull that. And so uh, other items can also be pulled. Uh, you can ask questions, commissioners can ask questions uh, without pulling an item. And I'll, uh, I'll open it up. I see Commissioner McPherson, you are up first. Thank you. I appreciate it. I just want to make a comment on number 12, uh, authorizing uh, our director to uh, negotiate and enter to a, a cooperative agreement with the San Lorenzo Valley School District on the Highway 9 uh, project. That's probably not going to be going on until 2024 or so. Um, but uh, this is a very uh, complicated uh, issue because we have the state on Highway 9, the county, the RTC, Metro, and the school district in this. And we all have to be... Uh, be on the same um, same direction, moving in the same direction. And I really ap appreciate the cooperative effort with the San Lorenzo Valley School District. Uh, and uh, if I can just uh, put a, a little asterisk on that too, this cooperative venture is not unlike what we experienced last Friday at the Highway uh, 17 uh, wildlife crossing that uh, Chair Brown was at as well. Uh, that was the state, the county, the RTC, the land trust. Tremendous event uh, is uh, well underway, and it's going to be a, something we can be proud of. So those were the two carve outs that we had on uh, our the voters approved in Measure D. I'm glad to see one is um, under construction, and the other one is uh, going to be underway and with the cooperation of the San Lorenzo Valley School District. So just wanted to comment on that. Thank you, Commissioner McPherson, and thank you for all of your work uh, in moving this forward as well. I know you've been uh, a central figure and uh, really committed to, to making this happen. Thanks. Commissioner Caput. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to move for approval uh, uh, after public comments, so go ahead. Okay, gotcha. All right, we'll uh, go out to the public now on con our consent agenda items. This is Items four through 22, with the exception of item 11. Uh, we have a hand I'm looking for. Uh, and so I'll call on our first speaker, Maggie Alma. Ms. Alma, you are up and you should be able to speak if you need to press unmute on your screen on your zoom screen so we can hear you it looks like community bridges needs to give her the opportunity to speak okay so you TV, are sorry. 
<laughs> Ms. Ama, you Okay, I found it. Oh, there you go. Ama. Got it. Oh, geez, Hi. Nice. Hi, thank you, um, commissioners and chair. Uh, okay. Um, I'm chair of the climate committee for the local Sierra Club. I, I'm hoping I'm talking about the right item at the right time because I'm going to be talking about um, keeping the tracks. So I'm just asking this up front. Ms. Alma, we are on the consent agenda uh, so that we will be talking about the uh, rail and trail configuration as item 28 that, that will be coming up uh, okay. after after consent. And okay, thanks. Right. I'll, I'll, I'll come back. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, we'll now return to the commission for uh, motion and action. Mr. Caput. Okay, yeah, I'll make the motion, uh, motion again. Second. We approve everything but number 11 on the consent agenda. Right. Okay, we have a motion and a second to improve, approve our consent agenda with the exception of item 11, and we'll take a roll call vote. Commissioner Bertrand? I approve. Commissioner Sandy Brown? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Aye. Commissioner Alternate Hearst? Aye. Commissioner Caput? Aye. Commissioner Alternate Schifrin? Aye. Commissioner Alternate Quinn? Aye. Commissioner Koenig? Aye. Commissioner McPherson? Aye. Commissioner Kristen Brown? Aye. Commissioner Parker? Yes. Commissioner Rockin? Aye. That passes unanimously. Okay. So we will now move on to item 11, the item pulled from our consent agenda. This item is a recommendation to approve rejection of a bid for the Pajaro River Bridge Rehabilitation Project along the Santa Cruz Branch Line. And I will ask staff to um, give us an update on uh, this item. Thank you, Chair Brown. This is Sarah Christensen. I'll be giving the staff report on item 11. So staff recommends rejecting the bid for the Pajaro River Bridge Rehabilitation Project along the branch line. Staff advertised this project in March and opened bids on April 25th. We received one bid. Staff considers the bid prices to be unreasonable. Um, in other words, uh, we consider this a bad bid. Um, <clears throat> we recommend rejecting the bid for that reason. Um, I just wanted to shed a little bit of light on the potential reasoning for the one bid. Um, this is really specialized work. This is uh, rehabilitation of a railroad bridge. It is fully acknowledged that rail banking has been firmly opposed by Roaring Camp. However, rail banking is the most effective mechanism for RTC to preserve the portion of the corridor not being used for freight. And this provision of staff's alternative recommendation has been awarded to acknowledge that rail banking reduces RTC's financial exposure for either scenario presented in staff's written report. Next slide, please. In November 2016, over two-thirds of Santa Cruz County voters approved a 30-year half-cent transaction and use tax, or sales tax, for transportation projects and programs. We'll refer to this as Measure D 2016. Almost 30% of funding is directly allocated to our four cities and the county for what is known as neighborhood projects. There are carve-outs for $10 million for Highway 9, and the San Lorenzo Valley, and $5 million for the Highway 17 wildlife crossing. 20% of revenue is directly allocated to Santa Cruz Metro and community bridges for bus and paratransit services. On the left side of the pie chart are three regional project categories. 25% of Measure D revenue must be spent on highway corridors, which includes improvements such as auxiliary lanes, bus on shoulder improvements, bicycle and pedestrian overcrossings, transportation demand management programs, and safety and congestion relief programs. 
17% of Measure D revenue is for active transportation improvements, specifically the coastal rail trail. This category includes not only the design and construction of new coastal rail trail segments, but also ongoing rail corridor property management and preventative maintenance, including oversight, encroachments, drainage, vegetation control, and other rail corridor needs. Fund can also be used to maintain the trail segments themselves once constructed. Finally, 8% of Measure D revenue is designated for the rail corridor preservation and analysis of options. This is the funding that we are using to preserve and maintain rail specific infrastructure, such as track, ties, and rail bridges. The funding may also be spent to analyze corridor uses, including environmental and economic analysis. However, Measure D revenue do not include funding for any new train or rail service. Although 2016 Measure D provides significant funding to deliver investments identified in the expenditure plan, it is insufficient to fully fund most projects. Consistent with the measures ordinance and long range strategic implementation plan, in order to exped expeditiously deliver programs and projects and to competitively position projects to leverage other grants, most agencies utilize some measure revenues to serve as a match to other grants and or focus some funds on pre-construction phases in order to get projects shovel ready or more competitive for grants and other funding opportunities. Each agency receiving measure revenues is required to annually develop, update, hold a public hearing on and adopt five-year program of projects that identify how they plan to use measure D revenue in the upcoming five years. The Regional Transportation Commission is responsible for developing five-year plans of regional expenditure plan categories and projects. The RTC planned on adopting five-year plan updates for all regional project categories in the fall. However, updates for fiscal year 23 through 27 for the active transportation and highway corridor categories are being presented at this meeting to allow RTC to commit Measure D funding for grant leveraging opportunities and to make funds available due to cost overruns. Next slide. Uh, this will now be presented by Grace Blakesley. Good afternoon, commissioners and members of the public. As you can see on this slide, segments of the Coastal Rail Trail are in various stages of development and some segments are completed and open to the public. To date, Coastal Rail Trail projects have largely utilized Measure D funds to complete or advance pre-construction activities and to leverage state and federal grant funds. The focus of today's meeting is funding for construction segment seven, phase two, from Bay, California to Pacific Avenue and development of segments eight through 12 from Pacific Avenue in the city of Santa Cruz to Rio Del Mar and the unincorporated area of the county of Santa Cruz. Segment seven, phase two is ready to be constructed and segment eight through 12 are in the preliminary design and environmental phase. As part of the project development for segments eight through 11, public input on the schematic plans was solicited in March and April. Segments eight through 11 can be viewed in the pink color in the middle of the slide and segment seven phase two is shown near the middle of the slide in red. These trail projects are primarily within the existing rail right of way and do not include new passenger rail service but provide options for preserving the rail line right of way for future passenger or freight service. As described in prior reports to the RTC, preliminary designs are being developed for the ultimate trail project, which would be constructed next to the existing rail line alignment and an optional interim trail phase where the trail is built on the existing track alignment. Each environmental impact report is analyzing the potential impacts of the ultimate trail configuration and the interim optional phase and the interim trail as an optional phase because the phase is not required to construct the ultimate trail. If the interim trail should be constructed and later the rail line reactivated, the trail would need to be relocated. The Measure D five-year plan also continues to pro the existing program funding for segment five as a grant match and segment 18 phase two development. There are still segments of Coastal Rail Trail primarily between Rio Del Mar and the County of Santa Cruz and the City of Watsonville that have not been initiated. Next slide, please.
As I mentioned, segment seven is ready for construction. Bids received April 21st, 2020, bids were received April 21st, 2022, following your last meeting. The low bid plus a 10% contingency is $11.9 million. Construction is scheduled for fall 2022, so this year. And funding for construction comes from a state active transportation program cycle four in the amount of 8.6 million, local city and Santa Cruz measure D in the amount of 2.15 million. And today you will be considering the city of Santa Cruz request for regional measure D active transportation funds in the amount of 1.15 million to close the funding gap for construction. Next slide. Cost estimates have been prepared for segments eight and nine led by the city of Santa Cruz and segments 10 and 11 led by the county of Santa Cruz and segment 12 led by RTC. The city and county of Santa Cruz presented these cost estimates at public open houses for their respective projects in March and April. To provide the most up-to-date information, the cost estimates for segments eight through 12 were reevaluated and updated as needed to reflect the cost for materials and labors as shown in segment seven phase two bid prices. The updated cost amounts are shown on this slide. These costs are shown in 2022 dollars and are expected to increase with escalation between now and when the projects are constructed. The costs that you see here include the cost for construction as well as the cost for environmental preliminary design and environmental work, which can range from 10 to 20 percent of project costs. Measure D has played a key role in funding pre-construction costs for these projects and making them more competitive for grant funds. As noted in the slide, the interim trail cost estimate includes funding to rehabilitate and repurpose the Capitola trestle. The ultimate trail cost does not include the replacement of the Capitola trestle needed for passenger rail and trail. The cost estimate for the interim trail shown here is the cost to design and construct an interim trail on the existing rail line alignment. At prior meetings, we have also shown the cost to demolish the interim trail and rebuild the rail for freight, as well as final design and construction of the ultimate trail configuration. These additional costs reflect the interim nature of the phased approach. By adding the two costs you see here together, you can come fairly close to that total cost to complete the interim trail and then construct the ultimate trail. The cost estimates for the ultimate trail are to construct the trail next to the rail line alignment. And in some locations, this requires relocating the existing track and the cost to relo relocate the track in some locations is included in this project cost. Track relocation would be constructed to serve freight. We are often asked about the cost per mile for the trail and the answer is that it varies. This is because the structures required to complete a particular segment often play a significant role in determining the cost and need um, the cost and need for structures and the type of structures vary across the 32 miles of the coastal rail trail. This variation in cost per mile is true for both the interim and the ultimate trail. In general, however, current cost estimates indicate a cost of 6 million per mile for interim trail or 16 million per mile for ultimate for segments 9 through 11. Segment 12 is significantly higher because the project is primarily comprised of bridges, which are very costly. At our last meeting, we were asked to provide information about the amount of funds that would be allocated if Measure D regional funds were distributed by mile, by trail mile. This would be approximately 3.9 million per mile once corridor maintenance was taken off the top. It's important to note that this would be total funds per mile, including any maintenance cost programmed. Keep in mind, these costs will continue to be refined as the projects move into final design and project sponsors will look for opportunities for cost savings and updates to unit costs. We will also be updating the project fact sheets with the most current cost estimates this month. Next slide. So these projects are well underway. Currently, city and county and RTC are preparing preliminary design and environmental documents for segments eight through 12. The preliminary designs for segments eight through 11 were were reviewed by the public and will be finalized and inform the environmental analysis of potential project impacts. The environmental review is scheduled to be completed in spring 2023 with draft environmental impacts reports released later this year. Should construction funding be secured, segments eight through 12 would begin construction in 2024 and 25 and segment seven in 2022. Segment eight and nine is scheduled to complete final design prior to segment 10 and 11 due to previously awarded grant funding deadlines associated with this project. 
Meanwhile, segment 10 and 11 is still seeking funding for final design. The County of Santa Cruz Measure D request considered by you today includes a request for segment 10 and 11 final design costs. Next slide. We want to review key decision points that the commission makes that provide direction to RTC staff and project sponsors and inform how the projects are developed. We mentioned some of these at the RTC's transportation policy workshop two weeks ago, and we've added a few more here. Cooperative agreements and right of entries for construction are considered by the RTC, and they include a description of the project and its alignment. Programming measure D funding, also considered by RTC and being considered today, inform available funding and grant opportunities. As a responsible agency, RTC will also need to concur with the environmental impact report findings. And cooperative agreements for maintenance will explain maintenance funding obligations. Next slide. So project sponsors have requested additional Measure D Regional Active Transportation Program funds to continue to, excuse me, to continue to develop these trail projects. The City of Santa Cruz is requesting an additional 1.15 million in Measure D Active Transportation Category funds. As mentioned in an earlier slide, construction bids received on April 21st exceeded the available funding of 10.6 million by approximately 2.15 million. The additional 1.15 million, if programmed by the RTC, would partially close the funding gap to award the construction contract, and this would be in addition to the 2.1 million funds previously programmed to this project. For segments eight and nine, the city of Santa Cruz is requesting $370,000 to support the preliminary design and environmental phase. This $370,000 is in addition to $2 million in RTC Measure the Active Transportation Funds previously programmed to this project to serve as a grant match. The city of Santa Cruz plans to submit a grant application for cycle six, state active transportation program funds to construct the ultimate trail alignment. As mentioned at your last meeting, the city of Santa Cruz submitted a competitive application for cycle five program funds and was just below the award line. The city has continued to develop the project and expects to improve its score under project delivery metric. In general, the coastal rail trail projects within the more urbanized areas advance many of the state active transportation program goals and are expected to score well. For segments 10 and 11, the County of Santa Cruz is requesting $237,000 to support preliminary design and environmental phase. Under scenario two, which is staff's revised recommendation as Guy described, the County of Santa Cruz is also requesting 12.8 million for final design and construction of the trail alignment next to the railroad track. Since the RTC's transportation policy workshop two weeks ago, the Measure D Active Transportation Funds requested by the county for scenario two increased by 3 million to reflect the, to reflect the most recent material and labor costs submitted for the segment seven phase two project. If approved, a total of 17 million in Measure D Regional Active Transportation Funds would be programmed to this project. <clears throat> the County of Santa Cruz is also planning to submit a cycle six active transportation plan grant application to fully fund segments 10 and 11 and approval of this measure D funding request would provide a 20% match. Lastly, segment 12. Since development of segment 12 is combined with the Highway 1 State Park to Freedom project, staff has split the cost of the project according to what is allowed by Measure D expenditure plan and a portion of segment 12 is funded by the Highway Corridors Program due to the bicycle and pedestrian overcrossings of Highway 1. To advance this project, RTC is requesting 12.6 million from the Measure D active transportation category for final design, right of way, and construction of the trail adjacent to the railroad tracks, which amounts to 10.8 million through fiscal year 2027 and 1. million in future fiscal years. The balance of the segment 12 funding plan is a combination of Measure D highway category funds and state and or federal funds. Next slide.
staff will, in, will solicit input from the commission, committees, and the public on funding maintenance, including whether local jurisdictions should be required to fund more or all the maintenance needs. I'm going to pass it off to Sarah Christensen. Thank you, Grace. Uh, really quickly, before you start, Ms. Christensen, I did hear the uh, announcement that the recording had stopped and just hoping somebody out there with control over these matters can, uh, can work on getting that resolved um, while we proceed. Okay. 25% okay. um, of Measure D goes to the Highway Corridors Program with an expenditure plan that includes improvements on Highway 1, including auxiliary lanes, bus on shoulder, and bicycle pedestrian overcrossings, as well as programs such as Transportation Demand Management, or TDM, Safe on 17, and Freeway Service Patrol. The Highway 1 Program of Projects <clears throat> currently has three projects under development. Phases one and two shown in this map are fully funded and scheduled to begin construction in 2022 and 2023, respectively. The phase three project completes the last- Recording in progress. Oh, good. We're back on. The phase three project completes the last two and a half miles of the seven and a half mile auxiliary lane and bus on shoulder facility along Highway 1 and includes the Coastal Rail Trail Segment 12 within the branch line right-of-way with two dedicated bicycle and pedestrian overcrossings in APAS. In this phase three project, although the cost is um, significant, I think the, the cost of this project exceeds the other two projects combined. I just wanna note that the benefit of this project is um, it's pretty incredible. And um, this phase three project is really gonna transform the transportation system of this county. The project between Freedom Boulevard and State Park Drive along Highway 1, which includes segment 12 of the Coastal Rail Trail is in the environmental phase and could be funded by both the Measure D Highway Corridors Program and the Active Transportation Program as Grace mentioned, because project elements are included in both expenditure plans. The cost estimates for the project were split according to the two programs expenditure plans and what is allowed and the costs associated with the highway project are shown in this table by scenario. The new and previously programmed Measure D funds are shown in this table. Staff recommends programming funds to the ongoing program, so the TDM, Safe Fund 17, and FSP programs through fiscal year 27. In addition, due to the incredible grant opportunity upon us, staff recommends programming funds for either scenario to serve as the RTC's commitment for the local match. And just to note that this commission has already um, committed a significant amount of funds to the pre-construction phases of this project, and it's well underway. The proposed programming actions signify a commitment of local funds for competitive state grant funding opportunities. Under scenario one, to build the trail along the railroad alignment, <clears throat> the grant requests and total project costs are shown in this table. The City of Santa Cruz plans to apply for construction funds of segments eight and nine, and the county plans to apply for both final design and construction funds for segments 10 and 11. The Senate Bill 1 grant program only funds the construction component of the segment 12 and Highway 1 project, and RTC plans to apply for uh, 88.7 million to fully fund construction of the Highway 1 Segment 12 project. And just to note that 88.7 million is only partial to the full ask, which would include a project along SoCal Drive uh, implemented by the County of Santa Cruz, as well as other um, transit improvements. Under scenario two, to build the trail adjacent to the railroad tracks, the grant requests and total project costs are shown in this table. And typically a lower total project cost is gonna result in a lower grant request amount and a higher, obviously a higher um, project cost is gonna result in a higher grant request. Um, that is with the exception of the Highway 1 and Segment 12 project. 
So staff considers that 88.7 million uh, requests being at the kind of the top end of what's considered competitive under the grant program that we are pursuing. The grant request um, remains the same under both, you know, scenario one and scenario two, and the difference uh, is being uh, covered by the local funds. So measure D would fill the gap between the two scenarios. A commitment of the local match is needed prior to June 15th, so that's coming up, um, and that's for the active transportation program that uh, city and county are pursuing, and uh, RTC as the implementing agency um, is pursuing the SB1 cycle three funds to fully fund the Highway 1 and Segment 12 project, um, which needs to be committed uh, this fall for the project and the application. And I'm going to hand it back over to Guy to finish up and bring us home. So thank you, Sarah. This slide shows two tables, the anticipated cost to measure D sales tax for the two scenarios based on our cash flow model analysis, which was presented at the April TPW meeting and considers borrowing or debt financing as a strategy to advance the projects before the revenue is earned. These tables have been adjusted since the TPW meeting to reflect expected costs and fees that Grace mentioned earlier, and that's due to the information learned in recent bid openings. The top table represents the funding scenario for an interim trial, whereas the bottom table summarizes a plan to directly implement the ultimate trial alongside the freight rail line. The interim trial funding analysis indicates that we almost have enough Measure D pay-as-you-go revenue to leverage grants to complete the highway and optional interim trail segments on their current schedules. There would be a need to borrow for approximately $7 million. The table also show that what we call future capacity. Future capacity is the revenue that we currently project that we will still earn and have available to fund other eligible program expenditures after funding these scenarios and any debt service incurred. This funding would not be available in the short term as we would be programmed to near capacity for the next five years. Future capacity will build gradually from about fiscal year 28 to the end of the sales tax measure in fiscal year 47. In the second table, the ultimate trail funding analysis shows that we would not have enough measure D pay as you go revenue to complete the ultimate trail unless we financed or borrowed money. For this second scenario, we calculated that approximately $77.9 million would need to be financed. Due to the higher cost of the projects and the need to pay debt service, the future capacity is notably less. But as the table indicates, we do have the ability to finance and fund for the projects currently under development um, for scenario two. Part of staff's recommendation is to commit funding to financing if pay-as-you-go revenue is insufficient to meet all funding commitments. Financing would be dependent upon future events and the timely delivery of projects. Beyond financing, it is also important to consider what's left to judge whether these funding levels might be an overcommitment of resources considering future potential programming needs. Although the highway auxiliary lanes and initial bus on shoulder improvements could be funded with either scenario, there are other highway congestion or safety improvements that RTC could pursue, dependent upon capacity. Is the remaining highway capacity enough? Well, it depends on what you want to achieve. As for the trail, we should consider whether the future capacity is, is enough to advance the remaining 12 and a half miles of trail. The remaining sections are located in Mid and South County and contain some of our most significant engineering challenges, including the trestles at Hidden Beach, Seascape, and La Selva. They also include the eroding bluffs over Manresa Beach and the sensitive habitat of Galligan and Harkin Sloughs. These locations are already sustaining impacts from climate change and may be costly. Staff only has planning level estimates for the trail for these other sections, but we will need to do a more advanced uh, engineering estimate and analysis to determine if we can stretch 
our remaining active transportation capacity to develop funding plans to deliver trail segments for the rest of the corridor. RTC also uses Measure D active transportation funds for ongoing corridor property management and preventative maintenance, including oversight, encroachment, drainage, vegetation control, and other rail corridor needs. Although we've included an estimate of this cost in our analysis, the cost of the corridor maintenance are very unpredictable. In addition to corridor maintenance, funding is also needed to maintain completed segments of trails. RTC has committed some funding towards trail maintenance. However, the model used did not commit funding for maintenance of constructed trail sections beyond fiscal year 27, and some sections have no maintenance funding proposed at this time. The RTC is working with local jurisdictions, state parks, and, and other agencies to update long-term maintenance cost estimates for the coastal rail trail. Staff estimates that approximately $79 million may be needed to fund the maintenance of all 32 miles of trail between now and fiscal year 47. As you can see, the active transportation capacity capacity cannot be the sole funding source for $79 million in maintenance, especially in scenario two. So RTC will need more assistance from local jurisdictions to ensure that the trial can be both completed and maintained. We also may want to consider the possibility of cost overruns since costs often exceed estimates. Next slide. The last component of staff's alternative recommendation is to advance discussions, and I'm, I'll repeat, to advance discussions to remove the unnecessary costs and risk associated with maintaining the freight obligation on the branch line in locations where there are no freight rail customers. The RTC has discussed rail banking extensively at public meetings as a cost-effective strategy to preserve the rail right-of-way. The rail line is out of service and RTC does not have the resources available to restore it. Rail banking will allow the RTC to defer the costs of freight related repairs until such time that that portion of the line is needed for freight rail service, which is not now. Rail banking preserves the integrity of the rail property and does not require the removal of any tracks. Rail banking also shields the RTC from potentially costly lawsuits when building any trail on property that RTC owns only for rail purposes. Thus, rail banking facilitates the construction of either the interim trail or the ultimate trail. Freight service can also complicate the implementation and operations of future passenger rail service. At this time, rail banking is the most effective way to preserve the corridor. However, rail banking could take two to three years if Roaring Camp continues to oppose it. So staff recommends advancing discussions, an opportunity to address Roaring Camp's concerns. RTC did not cause this 150 year old rail line to be out of service. Nonetheless, it is out of service and both parties need to respect each other's needs and limitations. Roaring Camp is disconnected from the national rail work now, yet they're still operating. Over time, RTC acknowledges that being disconnected could have more serious implications, but RTC does not have the resources to the re restore the line at this time. Staff is committed to good faith negotiations such that an agreement can be reached that focuses on the continued viability of this important community business, given our circumstances. Next slide. So the commission could choose one of the scenarios as put forth in staff's initial recommendation. However, staff feels that the alternative recommendation accomplishes the purpose of programming the funding needed to not miss this opportunity while not showing a preference before either the election or the environmental analysis. The alternative also seeks to address the obstacles caused by freight in the development of any rail trail project, scenario one or scenario two, given RTC's limited resources and the condition of the rail line. The commission could also consider programming funds to only a portion of the trail projects currently under development, 
or programming at lower amounts. With that, Madam Chair, staff is available for commissioner questions. After question, staff recommends you open the public hearing and receive valuable public input prior to commissioner discussion and action. Thank you, Director Preston and uh, staff for the presentation. I want to make a couple of comments on how we will proceed uh, regarding procedures and decorum for moving through this item. Uh, first, I just want to express appreciation to staff and the work that you all are doing to plan for and identify funding to meet our county's transportation needs under very challenging circumstances. Um, and, and ask that comments and questions raised with respect to that work be, be mindful of that commitment and respectful of that commitment. Uh, two, a rec I want to recognize the high level of interest and, and strong feelings, um, perhaps that's putting it mildly, <laughs> um, about future use of our rail corridor and ask that uh, all of our speakers on this issue, uh, the members of the public hey. and commissioners. Hey, how are we doing? Uh, was that? I think some, we, if we could mute um, people, those who are on who are not up to speak just yet, thanks. Um, so I, I just want to ask that all speakers on this issue uh, speak to the substantive policy and programming issues at hand, avoid personal attacks. Um, and so we'll proceed along the following lines as uh, suggested by Director Preston. Uh, I will open up the floor for commissioners to ask questions at this time. Please reserve your comments for after the public uh, hearing. And uh, so after commissioner questions are uh, asked and answered, we will uh, open the public hearing, hear from uh, as many <laughs> members of the public who are uh, want to speak. And I, I'll, um, if anyone's having trouble, um, you know, I'm not sure how to get, make sure those comments are delivered, but I want to make sure responding to a previous public comment about people not being able to uh, uh, raise their hands that that uh, can happen. Um, when that is uh, completed, we will return to the commission and that will be an opportunity for you commissioners to make your comments and, uh, and we'll have a entertain a motion at that time. Uh, so with that, I, uh, and I'm going to, do my best to uh, monitor and enforce this as we move forward. Uh, Commissioner Schifrin, you are up. Thank you very much. And I do want to thank staff, make that comment for um, the for the presentation. That's a lot of overwhelming information. Uh, I particularly appreciate the fact that the staff has now made a, their own recommendation. Uh, I really do look to the staff to make recommendations on these thorny issues um, because, you know, I respect their point of view even when I disagree with it, and it's good to know what they're thinking. Um, I do have a number of questions about the uh, staff's alternative um, recommendation. The staff report includes a number of recommendations um, it isn't clear how the alternative recommendation relates to the um, recommendations on page 28-1. Um, uh, for example, the, you know, the adopt a resolution to program um, scenario two, but there are other parts of the recommendations, for instance, the programming of additional funding for segment seven, phase two, uh, is not a segment, uh, is not a scenario to issue. So how are those two recommendations uh, related? So both scenarios included the segment seven costs. Both scenarios included the um, corridor maintenance cost and some trail maintenance costs. So there's really no difference. So basically we're programming at the highest level. So everything that was on the table, we're saying um, program the funding for it. Okay, um, great. That's a good, I appreciate that clarification. And um, could you clarify also uh, under A, what without specifying preference, does that mean that the programming will include both scenario one and scenario two, and there'll be no preference for one or the other? 
It would simply be programmed at the higher amount, but we would remove the scenario one, scenario two from the uh, five-year plan um, and just call it the programming for the coastal rail trail. But it'll be high enough um, that uh, any any alternative could move forward. Uh, be what move forward. then is the recommendation or is there a recommendation for um, the ATP grant applications? Um, will, how, how is that gonna relate to this? The money will be there for either one, but the commission at least needs to apply, as I understand it, for segment 12 ATP funding. What is there a recommendation for uh, which scenario would be applied for? No, we did not provide a recommendation to do so. We did not want to get ahead of um, the, the two issues, the vote and the environmental documents, um, and provide a recommendation there. Now that said, you know, with respect to the city of Santa Cruz, who's developing segments eight and nine, they've indicated that they're going to submit their application for the ultimate trail. Um, there are several decision points that um, uh, uh, Grace went through that will occur later and we'll have to bring forward to the commission and including cooperative agreements um, and funding agreements. So we'll have an opportunity to weigh in at a later time, but we've uh, effectively said we're not going to um, uh, dictate to the city of Santa Cruz uh, which scenario they should apply for. So are you saying that the commission will not be applying for uh, ATP funds for segment 12? Uh, RTC never planned to submit an application for ATP for segment 12. Uh, segment 12 is combined with the highway program and we felt that um, with the other two projects going after active transportation program grants, that that was an awful lot of ATP grants to try to bring home to the city of Santa, uh, uh, the region. So we've taken a different approach on segment 12 um, combined with the highway program. We've targeted the solutions to congested corridor program and the local partnership program. Those are both SB1 programs that the um, uh, CTC plans to um, uh, put out a, a notice of funding availability uh, in uh, August and uh, application should be due sometime around November. So if I'm understanding this correctly, the um, city will be applying for ATP funds for segments eight and nine and the county will be applying for uh, ATP funds for uh, segments 10 and 11 and the RTC will not be applying for any ATP funds at this time for segment 12. Is that correct? Yes. Um, on uh, number um, B, where it says commit to financing if, meeting, if needed to meet funding commitments, is this really referring to support for bonding if necessary? Yes, we have a policy that allows for it. This would just make sure that, you know, the commission understands that if you program to this amount and um, the grants are received and we want to actually be able to make the point that we will have to, to, to do some sort of debt financing. Okay, I just wanted to, that's why I, why I understood it. I just wanted to clear, make it clear that what the language meant. Under C where it says amend the fiscal year 23 budget to reflect programming, does that mean that, that it's, the budget's gonna be amended to affect, to reflect the programming at the highest amount? Yes, but I must say in fiscal year 23, the only new programming is the programming for the cost of overrun on segment seven, and then the additional funding to complete the environmental analysis by segments eight, nine, 10, and 11. So the big- Okay, I, that's good. I, I just, you know, I think these, I think it's, I, I appreciate the, you know, the uh, this compromise recommendation. But I want to be I want to be clear. I understand it, and hopefully uh, the public and other commissioners understand what exactly your what the recommendation is. And then, what does in number D? What what do you really mean by advanced discussions about rail banking? What 
what, how will that be operationalized? Well, what, what I, what I mean by that is, is I, I really do think that, you know, to reach this sort of a compromise, we need to be able to um, control costs on the corridor. Um, and rail banking is um, appropriate considering the, the situation with, with freight on the rail line. What I see happening is sitting down with Lauren Camp and talking about it. Uh, we, we've done that before. Um, we hadn't reached an agreement. I really don't think that there's going to be any substantial discussions immediately, but I do think that ultimately it, both parties need to come to the table. Uh, we need to understand their needs and they need to understand our limitations. And we need to respect those and come to some sort of an agreement so that they can be protected and we are not overextended. And so just to be clear, we can reach an agreement. If you know this, this, go back to the commission and 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 have future discussions on on, on what the progress we have made or not. Obviously, um, there's a good deal of controversy about the direction that staff wants to go, which is one of the reasons I wanted to really make sure that what you were proposing is understood by everyone. You're not proposing that the, an item be put on the next commission agenda to consider adverse abandonment of the line. What you're, what you're proposing is that commission staff continue go back to the table with Ryan Camp and seek an agreement that would allow for uh, that would be mutually acceptable regarding um, re regarding the use of the line which you hope and what you feel is needed would in include rail banking but that's what you're really the advanced advancing discussions really mean uh, continuing or and reestablishing uh, negotiations with we're on camp is that um is that a, is that a correct that is correct what you're proposing that is correct but as you noted you know there is opposition by roaring camp and we might not be able to make an agreement at which point then we we might need to br bring an item to the commission to have further discussions on what we do then you know, but we, that is not the proposal. That's not this, the proposal now. That's not the proposal now. And maybe the commission says at a later time that that's you, you've you've done as much as you can. So there's no predetermination at, in terms of where this is going to go. Um, other than there's an acknowledgement that more discussions are needed. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I I, I think you've answered my questions uh, sufficiently. Okay, uh, let's see, Commissioner Quinn, you're next. Oh, thank you, Chairperson, and thank you, RTC. My two questions are for better understanding. On the ultimate trail costs, are those costs specific to the trail alone, or do they include the cost of having it rail ready? And number two, in the ultimate trail, I'm understanding that the trail would in fact wind down through Capitola Village and not go over the bridge. So I just wonder if you could clarify those two questions. Yes, the cost estimates are for the trail only. They're not to rehabilitate the rail line or for passenger rail service. They're uh, to build a trail adjacent to the existing rail line. There are a few instances where the rail does need to move over. There may be a few more even as we go because there's some narrow sections of trail that we've asked the, the county to look at more um, uh, substantially to see if we can get uh, a standard trail by there. So there could be additional changes coming, but um, the cost estimates are for the trail only. And um, as for your question regarding the Capitola trestle, the uh, scenario one or interim trail includes rehabilitation of that trestle and repurposing of the bridge so the trail would go over the trestle and uh, not through town. But the ultimate trail will ultimately require replacement of that uh, 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 trestle to be able to serve both uh, freight rail and a trail. And that is beyond the scope of uh, that project. Um, it would add significant cost to the project and without a rail 
project identified, it, it, it really didn't make sense. It would have really blown up that cost estimate to something that was untenable. Um, if the Capitola trestle is ever replaced, it'll probably be replaced as part of a future passenger rail project. Um, that would include a new bridge that could accommodate both rail and trail. Thank you. Commissioner Hurst. Uh, thank you very much, Chair Brown. I, I too am uh, pleased to hear of the spirit of cooperation and uh, the hard work of staff on this. But we only have uh, two options presented before us. I'm wondering if there could be a third option where the, the trail is uh, proceeds uh, where it can uh, adjacent to the rails and gets built and where it's problematic now that that kind of uh, waits for a later date. And that might mean that the whole uh, line, the whole, the whole trail might not be connected at once, but the portions of it uh, could be phased in. And then later when planning and access and funding permit, it could be all connected. You know, I've been on a lot of trails that uh, sometimes you have to detour or bypass or sometimes even have to turn around and uh, go back. And that may be the case here, especially with finances uh, so limited. So I'm glad to hear of the creativity that the staff has. And I think that some other option besides uh, putting in facilities that later have to be torn out, that would be a big waste of money but we we could use say segments at a time and they could all be connected later on. So I think that that should be a, a, a another consideration considering the restriction of funding at this time. Thank you. And that's my question. So yes, Mr. Hurst, that is an option that is available to the commission. Thank you. All right, Commissioner McPherson. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, most of the questions uh, the questions have been asked, but I, I just wanted to think, thank the staff for what everything is done. And at this time, for us to leave our options open uh, based on fact-based uh, data, and uh, you know that uh, I, we've all gotten a lot of letters and so forth from people about uh, the wait till after the ballot measure on June seventh, the Greenway ballot measure. We're going to do that, I'm sure. So uh, I just want to give some assurance that that's going to be the case. Uh, but I do thoroughly enjoy the options, especially when we have project level EIR still being dis developed and uh, the voters still need to weigh in on uh, the Greenway initiative on June 7th. So I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Uh, thank you. Commissioner Koenig, thank question. You, thank you. Um, the first question is, is kind of to the grant application piece by the city and the county, which I, you know, are due, I think, June 15th. Um, and, uh, well, I understand that the city is committed to applying for the ultimate trail to have maximum flexibility and, and you know, ideally get as many, much funds as possible uh, for construction. Um, can they write that application in a way that they'll have flexibility to, to build the interim phase if needed? If we wanted to build in the flexibility, I would say that it would be important that we not specify things um, um, in the application that would be take away that flexibility. So um, I wouldn't necessarily refer to the rail line. I would talk about building a trail within the rail right away. Okay, got it. So, so if we if we do it right, we can have that maximum amount of flexibility. That's good. Um, and then, I mean, I'm really glad that this report finally looks at the maintenance costs. Uh, I mean, I feel like as as a county supervisor, half of my job is just dealing with the maintenance of our 600 miles of county road network, which we're constantly falling short on. Um, and, and then, you know, maintenance of things like our parks facilities, um, whether that's removing trash um, or, you know, trying to clean up after encampment. So I mean, maintenance is a huge issue. And we're constantly talk about how, oh, well, it's so great that we got state and federal money to build our road network, but oh no, we don't have any money to maintain it. And of course that drives uh, Santa Cruz County residents crazy every day. 
Um, so we really, it's, it's good that we're finally talking about maintenance. Um, the question here is what maintenance agreements are in place today as far as any of the segments that are under construction or, or that we're planning for? So right now we have um, maintenance uh, included in our cooperative agreement with the city for segment seven. Um, uh, we committed funding just for the five year period and we, we propose to um, continue that. And um, uh, we're working on an amendment that uh, will come forward um, at a subsequent meeting um, to add the money for segment uh, seven phase two and provide a little bit more clarity on the maintenance because um, there's been some uh, some issues in, in terms of what it, it really includes. Um, uh, we're looking at it as uh, everything on on one side of the fence should be should be considered trail maintenance. Um, and, and everything on the other side of the fence um, be considered corridor maintenance. Um, right now with the city of uh, Santa Cruz, um, they're offering to split the maintenance cost with us 50-50, um, um, but that's about as far as we've gotten. And we figured that was kind of a stop gap while we came up with a, a more comprehensive plan. Um, We've talked to the county about maintaining segment five, but they've indicated that they do not have funding for maintenance and have asked us to cover 100% of the cost. If that continues, and if all of the other jurisdictions say, well, we wanna be treated equally with the county, then we'd be in a situation where we would not have enough money to build and maintain the trail. Right. We have more work to do on maintenance agreements. Yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely think we need those maintenance agreements in place so that as we're proceeding, we're we're ensuring that we, uh, as you said, are budgeting enough money to to finish the entire trail. I mean, if you want to talk about equity, like it's it's budgeting so that everyone gets their fair share of the trail in each part of the county. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Bertrand, questions. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So, um, yes, thank you so much for staff to coming up for the uh, second um, uh, proposal. Uh, it recognizes a lot of the comments of the public. So the fact that you listen to the public, and I'm sure many commissioners phoned you up about the same thing. So thank you very much. Um, Commissioner Quinn asked a question I, I didn't quite get the answer to. So this is to Guy, and I'm also very interested in. So if the um, interim tail, trail happens and you have to move the tracks and, and put them back together and stuff like that. Um, how would you characterize the condition of the tracks and what would they be able to be used for in that interim trail situation? Because so our, our track is um, generally between accepted or what's known as class one track. Um, Accepted track cannot be used for passenger rail. You know, as discussed in the earlier item, um, RTC does have the responsibility and the incur current agreement to bring the track up to class one. Um, uh, accepted track, uh, freight can travel at 10 miles an hour, no passenger service on it. Um, class one would uh, track uh, freight, again, can travel at 10 miles per hour. Um, and passenger rail can move at 15 miles per hour. We, we The areas that require track um, to be moved include portions of segments nine and 10. And I've mentioned earlier, I think another section needs to be looked at in segment 11. And if we move the track over, we would be building it to class one standards. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Schifrin. Yeah, I just wanted to ask one last clarifying question before we open it up to the public. Given how strongly people feel about the various alternatives, I, I, am I correct that the commission today is not making a decision on either alternative? Uh, whether people are supportive of what's called the interim trail or the ultimate trail, all that's being considered today is the programming of the programming of money. Mm -hmm. And that, as I understand it, and you'll tell me if I'm wrong, and 
in the program, in the recommendation, in the staff recommendation at this time, the um, recommended money to be programmed would cover either option. So there's no need to have a big debate about which option uh, we prefer, where we would like to go. And in addition, there is no decision today um, in favor or opposed to rail banking. All the recommenda rec recommendation is, is to have staff continue to work with Roaring Camp to seek uh, um, a, a mutually acceptable agreement. If that's correct, I would hope members of the public would focus on this staff recommendation and really look at this as a, um, you know, I guess I'm worried about 100 people telling us whether they either want one scenario or the other scenario when that is really not before us today. What's before us today is, sim if I'm understanding it correctly, is simply programming money and the recommendation is to program the money in such a way that it would it would cover the cost of either scenario. Is that correct? So um, it's mostly correct. And, oh, and I know no. why you're you're asking that, because um, I did leave on you know the table that you guys could make any um, uh, recommendation that you want, but you are correct, and it's just programming a fund even if you were to select one scenario over the other, it wasn't set in stone, but, but there was concerns that that would um, show preference. So to not show preference and program at the higher level staff's alternative recommendation, that there would be no doubt that there would be no preference shown and that was stated in the um, alternative recommendation and it would be put forth in the um, resolution. So if if you go with the uh, you know the compromise sort of um, this is a way to move forward and not show preference, then you are correct that there would be you know absolutely no doubt. But either way, you were correct in that we would always have had the ability to um, change direction. And and this is only a programming exercise. Thank you. Um, on the basis of that, I'm going to pull a Mike Rotkin and say my intention um, will be after the, uh, unless um, I'm somehow uh, convinced otherwise, my intention would be to support the staff, to make a motion to support the staff recommendation. I think it's a reasonable way to allow us to move forward at this time when we're really legally not able to choose an alternative anyway. I'll second. <laughs> yeah, lots of us will second that when it comes yes. to it. Yes, yes, when yes. It, when, it, when it comes to it. All right. Um, so in order for it to come to us, uh, we do uh, want to open the public hearing now. I appreciate <laughs> the question posed by Commissioner Schifrin to try to uh, help the, the public, uh, the viewing public and those with intention to speak um, recognizing people have very strong feelings and have prepared to make comments. I don't want to limit those, but um, I, I, I hope you you heard the <laughs> um, the intention here. And um, so we're we're not um, uh, you know we're not making final decisions about ultimate versus uh, interim uh, that are going to lock us into. Uh, a particular path. Um, so with that, I'll um, call on Commissioner Rodkin before Wait, I, I open the public hearing. I just <laughs> want to point out to the public that comments about the choice, which will come to us at some point, no doubt, is uh, most effectively addressed close to the time when we're making the decision. It's making strong arguments now when we're not actually making that decision today is kind of, I don't want to say it's wasting your time, but obviously we'll pay attention and we'll have some impact on what we think about things. But if you really want to be effective, you should wait till the meeting's happening when that choice is really before us to be most effective in making your comments count. That's my only comment. Okay. Um, so with that, I am going to open up to the public and begin with our list. We have right now we have 13 uh, speakers with hands up. Uh, mm -hmm. If you are interested in speaking on this issue, please uh, raise your, get your hand up so we can get a sense of um, about how long we expect this item to take. 
Um, if we end up with many, many, many speakers, I may reduce the time allotted um, to uh, allow us to complete our business today. Um, so just get your hands up. I see 19 now, and we will begin with uh, Robin Belkin. You have two minutes. Hey, this is Robin Belkin. I am very concerned about any funds spent on doing anything. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I'm doing anything that makes the ultimate trail cost more. Anything that has to be undone later. You have already exhaustively studied all available options and you arrived already at the conclusion that the ultimate plan was the best. So hearing you talk about you're not sure yet really concerns me deeply. Also, I understand there's some funds that have a sunset clause. If they're not used by the set deadline, we're just gonna lose them, which really bothers me. I really would like to see this process accelerated substantially, the rate of progress, the application for all the funds at this optimal time that are available, the state transportation funds, the federal and state gas tax funds, the 2016 tax measure funds from the former tax measure D for 30 years, the new $1.4 trillion infrastructure funds and anywhere else possible. Uh, I really am bothered that we're still talking about this, and I hope I never hear the word rail banking again. There's too many forces in this county that want to abuse that and see any increment toward getting us to do that as a step toward an agenda to rip out and destroy our railroad forever. I, I do not want to hear that word again. I don't think it's ever worked anywhere where uh, in the history of rail banking. So please stop. And I thank you for your work and your time. I really would like to see you move on with the ultimate plan. Uh, blessed are those that plant trees under whose shade they may never sit. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Saladin Sale. Hi, I am M. Saladin Sale. Um, honoring uh, Commissioner Schifrin's uh, suggestion uh, that we have a, uh, a gentle person's agreement uh, <laughs> with regard to uh, taking no action today with regard to rail banking uh, other than to uh, encourage uh, staff to continue discussions with Roaring Camp uh, I will uh, spare you my, my larger passionate uh, advocacy for uh, rail and trail. Um, just want to uh, ask that uh, the guidance to staff uh, in the uh, alternate resolution that Executive Director Preston presented uh, be clarified as to its intent uh, that it is just to continue discussions so that uh, well-meaning souls don't take the uh, uh, suggested alternative resolution uh, to mean something that it doesn't. I think that in the interest of transparency and clarity for those folks who uh, mostly get their information from the, uh, the pages of the newspapers uh, or inflammatory content uh, uh, on social media, all of that just drives us farther apart. And what I've heard today um, is a, a real uh, a continued coming together. And this is, I think this is our path uh, and our track that will uh, bring us forward. So that's my suggestion is uh, to clarify what the meaning of, uh, I believe that was uh, part D of uh, Executive Director Preston's alternative. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Brian Peoples. Hey everybody, Brian from Trail Now. You know, when we supported Measure D in 2016, the expectation was that we would be 
the RTC would be very disciplined in the financial use of our tax dollars. And included in that expectation was the timeline that it would take to open the coastal corridor. We truly need to move forward and that's a very important element when we talk about uh, improving our transportation. We support um, rail banking from Watsonville to Davenport. Uh, we do not support spending one, an additional money for segment 7B. That is so overpriced. We really encourage you not to do that. And then we want you to think about um, putting a project as part of the five-year program of projects that would have the entire rails removed from Watsonville to Davenport, even though some of it may be a simple dirt trail as you progress, because opening that up as a dirt trail will significantly make our community safer. And I wanna remind you of the 12 year old boy that was in the ICU with me, um, who was critically injured. And we're having those kind of instances. And that's why, you know, you're putting a lot of emphasis on the money part and the, the idea of having future rail. Let's really start to think about the time part. How long is it gonna take us to open the coastal corridor? Because it's already been 10 years and people are gonna die and they're gonna get hurt if we don't have that coastal corridor opened up for active transportation. So just remember people in, uh, you know, I was very sad seeing the 12 year old in there, can't really talk about it, but thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jessica for Ultimate Rail and Trail. Uh, Hi, uh, am I unmuted? You are. Okay, this is Jessica Evans. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioners, for the opportunity to speak. Um, so I just want to start by um, saying how much I appreciate the revised recommendation from staff. Um, I can't tell you how strongly I feel that this is a huge uh, improvement um, and is really important showing uh, the community that, you know, that staff does understand and respect that, um, that, you know, it's important not to uh, make recommendations before the environmental, uh, the IRs are done and, and when there's an outstanding issue in front of the community that the community is about to vote on. So um, I, I just, I just really very much appreciate the revised recommendation. Um, I, I encourage the commission to adopt the revised recommendation to program the Measure D active transportation and highway corridors revenue at the higher amount without specifying a preference between the two scenarios. Um, understanding that the decisions regarding those scenarios will be made after the IR is complete and the election is not an issue. Um, and I support continuing the conversation with Roaring Camp and I appreciate uh, that we're no longer talking about pursuing adverse abandonment, but instead we're talking about having a conversation. Um, so, um, and finally, I wanna say I very much uh, support the recommendation to fund segment seven. As a resident of the West Side, I look forward to segment seven being finished. Um, and that concludes my remarks, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Barry Scott. Thank you, uh, thank you, commissioners. I uh, am I'm encouraged to see that uh, the direction is to aim for the uh, the ultimate trail funding, and, and you know it's reasonable to keep options open. So I thank you for working together. I thank you too for working with Boring Camp and Progressive in all matters relating to the rail line, uh, because after all, the RTC is a brand brand new to the business of maintaining operating. Uh, railroads, and it's great that you work with your partners in this. Um, I want to revisit a, a, an item, however, that I think is reasonable for a citizen to ask uh, about, and I'm, I'm formally requesting some form of proof. It may be an oversight or it may exist, but for these first seven miles, the, the fact that Progressive has been using the first two or 2.5 miles uh, cannot be taken as proof that the entire line was improved absent some independent uh, inspector's report. Um, the contract exists and the contract uh, should be 
when you reach a, a milestone like this, it should be agreed by all parties that uh, an expectation has been satisfied. So, like I said, it may be an oversight, but I'm formally requesting uh, some evidence of an inspection. And it might be that the inspections weren't done and still need to be done. So for that first uh, seven miles, please uh, please look into this. I'll be, I'll be asking for this uh, more formally later. Thank you for the new recommendation and let's build that ultimate trail now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Deb Molina. Commissioner uh, Brown, we're having a little bit of technical there. Okay, they just got it going. So I'll, I'll mute the other speaker. Sorry about that. Thank you. The timer didn't run down the last person, so maybe that needs to be. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, okay, sorry. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, hi. Thank you, RT staff, RTC staff and members for all your hard work. It must be just incredibly uh, difficult to put together all this information when you really don't know which way we're going. Um, I want to say that I'm excited about the bus on shoulder. I think that electric buses can really get people where they need to go cheaply and efficiently and give South County a reasonable transportation option. I agree that rail ban banking is needed. Um, I hear people being really nervous about rail banking. I'm not sure why. I think they need to do a little more investigation into that. Um, I want to state that I feel that segment seven, phase two, which is only 0.8 miles long, which is coming in at $12 million plus, I'm sure, should be reconsidered. Uh, this is an extreme amount of money and it's gonna have major excavations, 30 foot concrete retaining walls, uh, trees being cut down. And uh, it just seems like a, a ridiculous amount of money when there is a railroad corridor directly parallel that could be used easy, easily, cheaply, quickly. Um, I overwhelmingly endorse scenario one. To me, it's a clear winner. It's significantly cheaper as we found out. Um, but most importantly for me, it would provide a continuous trail and would not divert folks onto unsafe, busy surface streets. So um, yeah, thank you very much. And that's it. Thank you, Ms. Molina. Our next speaker is Paula Bradley. Thank you. I would like a clarification concerning the cost estimate for the interim trail versus the ultimate trail from the slides that were shown. I understand the proposed interim trail is only from the San Lorenzo River trestle to Lee Road, not a 32 mile trail such as the ultimate trail. So uh, if that's the case, I was thinking um, in terms of length, the interim trail and the ultimate trail are um, maybe the cost estimate per mile would be a better comparison. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bradley. I, I will uh, just say while we're so while people are waiting to speak. I'm tracking some of these questions and we will uh, try to come back around and, and get answers to the kind of specific clarifying and, and technical questions uh, that can be answered at this time at the end of public comment. Uh, okay, uh, Christina Watson, you are next. Hi, uh, commissioners, this is Christina Watson. I'm a director of planning with the Transportation Agency for Monterey County. And I just want to quickly uh, say that we look forward to continuing coordination with your staff and board to implement our long-term network integration vision and the state rail plan. And we hope that our joint uh, transit intercity rail capital program grant application we submitted earlier this year will be successful. We'll be hearing in June for the uh, Pajaro Watsonville train station, which includes the trail segment from the location of the station to the Pajaro River Bridge. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next up we have uh, David uh, Van Brink. Uh, hello, can you hear me all right? 
Yes, we can. Okay, yes, David Van Brink here. Um, thank you for this revised recommendation for uh, moving forward while retaining the flexibility to include a scenario two, which uh, I'm quite confident the community will uh, shortly indicate a preference for. Uh, this is great, very wise, I love it. <clears throat> I think it would make some people, including myself, more comfortable if uh, item D on the revised recommendation didn't say rail banking specifically, but rather something more like item D, work constructively with Roaring Camp and other stakeholders to protect their interests and limit RTC financial exposure. Um, so less prescriptive. Uh, and of course, please approve the funding uh, filler for segment seven phase two, how exciting. Thank you for everything you do, thanks. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Michael Saint. And Mr. Saint, you're muted. How's that? There you go. Okay, thank you, Chair Brown. Uh, I hate to sound like a broken record here, but I've heard Bus on shoulder uh, referred to uh, just in some recent uh, speakers verbiage. Um, I just want to clarify, I wish you wouldn't use that term, bus on shoulder, I took time during this meeting, which I had plenty of to look it up, is also known as a bus bypass shoulder program. Uh, it's a low cost way to bypass a congested arterial on the freeway. Um, just in the interest of transparency, when you refer to this project on the Ox Lane, could we use bus with cars or bus in traffic or even just say hybrid bus on shoulder? It's misleading to the public and we always get questions about what is actually this means. Um, it seems that we've reversed our previous position a couple of meetings ago. I remember Jack Brown, who's a Greenway supporter, saying, why are we even talking about interim trail um, or the extreme trail? Because they haven't got to June 7th on the measure vote yet. And I believe Director Preston also agreed with Jack on this point. Um, so my position is I'd, I'd support the staff's recommendation uh, with deleting scenarios one and two as being part of that and just say something like, both scenarios are capable of funding, period. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Rosemary Sarka, you are up. And yep, there you go. Yes. Uh, so our intention at Roaring Camp was to use this opportunity to underline items from our letter to you. Um, which you have in your file, and in particular in demonstration of our efforts to cooperate with respect to funding opportunities. Uh, RTC was successful in the 2020 SB1 cycle in obtaining funds for Highway 1 uh, by applying a multimodal corridor program, which includes Highway 1 rail corridor and active transportation. So we encourage RTC to pursue that strategy in the 2022 SB1 TCP cycle by again, including all three lines, legs of the multimodal corridor program, rail, not just highway and trail. In the upcoming cycle for the 2022 SB1 Trade Corridors Enhancement Program, there's an important opportunity for funding connected with the California Freight Mobility Plan 2020. This includes 800 million in funding that specifically highlights the eligibility of projects included in the freight mobility plan and two specific projects already designed for the Santa Cruz branch line, 25,000 to upgrade the rail line to a class two condition at 22, 25 million rather, and 22,410 to maintain and rehabilitate the railroad infrastructure. And this is in addition to possible grants on the federal level. On rail banking, we do look forward to uh, some understanding of our position uh, and why this is so important to us. And we hope that you will keep in mind the many comments you received in February uh, about this issue as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Jack Brown. Hey, thank you, Commissioner Brown. Um, just wanted to uh, give my support to, to Guy Preston and the uh, alternative, alternative resolution. 
I think it's a good place to be in between both polarizing sides of this issue and uh, states it about as best as we can. Um, and then I just wanted to, to give some commentary on, on rail banking. Um, I recently spent two and a half weeks in Washington, D.C., um, helping my mother who had knee replacement surgery. And my primary source of transportation during that time was using e-bike share while I was there. Um, on the one day I got off, I decided to take the Capitol Crescent Trail from Georgetown to uh, Bethesda, which is a rail bank trail, which is also being converted back into the Purple Line. And it's a beautiful trail and it's being used by thousands of people on a daily basis. And uh, I think we can have something beautiful like that here too. Um, uh, just a couple other comments was uh, someone, uh, it, I'm sorry I didn't catch the gentleman's name before, but had mentioned me. Um, I, I do agree with him too. I think we should have something like bus and auxiliary lane rather than what we really should be doing bus on shoulder. Uh, just to clarify that, you know, there is an impact with traffic there and hopefully we get ourselves to a point of bus, bus on shoulder in the future. And lastly, I just wanted to say thank you to all of you for putting yourselves out there and all this. I've got great respect for you now, now that I've been with the Yes on D campaign and, and hearing all the comments, but I really felt that when Guy Preston was giving his uh, initial information that for that no way supporter Tina Andreata to scream profanities was completely uncalled for and as a member of the public, I just want to apologize to you, Guy, and, and the rest of the uh, uh, commission for having to hear that from someone. Thank you. Okay, um, let's see here. So we are, the hands are continuing to go up and um, I, I've received uh, messages from uh, a couple of commissioners who uh, do have to uh, move on to other commitments today, and we do want to be able to vote on this before uh, we finish our meeting. So I'm going to, um, and I'm sorry to do this, um, we've just had a meeting that's gone on quite a bit longer than anticipated due to a couple of items. Um, so I'm going to reduce the time uh, for public speakers. Um, I kept hoping we were going to get be through, and then <laughs> the hands keep going up. So I want to reduce the the time for uh, to one minute. I'm sorry about that. Um, given the circumstances, I think um, it will get us through the the meeting uh, more efficiently. And um, those of you who have things you want to say about, again, the decision between uh, among rail and trail configurations, uh, since we're not really making a decision about that today, um, you will have plenty of opportunity to do that when the time comes, and, and there will be multiple occasions, I imagine. So um, I'm going to reduce the time to one minute. I apologize, um, but just in the, for the sake of completing our business today, we need to do that. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, Fena Siegel. Yes, good afternoon now. Thank you very much. Um, I just had a, a couple of comments and I'll be brief on uh, Director Preston's uh, alternative recommendation uh, that we're happy to see today. Um, and that is uh, for Section D, I would have to echo the comments from uh, Mr. Saladin Sale. Uh, that really I don't see that as being a, a recommendation about rail banking and that probably that should be reflected in any motion made. Um, and it really, you know, it's so important for us to include stipulations that protect both our tracks and our bridges uh, from, from being torn out. We, we may need that and it's silly to rip out infrastructure um, that is perfectly capable now, especially over segment 12, if there's not enough money, then we need to keep what we have at least available. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Catherine Mizuno. And if we could start the timer over, uh, thank you. That would be, that's great. Um, you are yes. muted. There you go. I'm here. I'm, I'm just, um, I am a retired teacher. I live in Watsonville and I'd just like to ask us all to stop back, take a step back and look at the big picture that climate change prevent, presents to all of us. 
And I just want to say that we are obliged to provide uh, emissions-free transportation for all people in uh, in our county, and we any decisions we make should uh, allow for that possibility. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Leah AC Frost. Ms. Frost, if you can unmute yourself, we, we're not able to hear you. Great. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, first off, I sincerely and respectfully want to apologize to all RTC staff for any perceived mistrust in their extensive and uh, thoughtful and cooperative efforts and recommendations that I've heard today. Um, I, I'm curious if the numbers um, on the perspective, prospectus um, on both scenarios include uh, potential um, profitable income from um, industry employers who may subsidize uh, mass transit for their employees um, and or attracting future industry to the area that depend on rail transportation. And also, you know, I really see this as a chicken and egg scenario with um, you know, option one and rail banking being short-sighted and, and pen, you know, penny-wise, but in the long-term pound foolish. So I really do appreciate Guy Preston's recommendation and wholeheartedly support that. So thank you again for your time and, and your efforts, everyone. Thank you, Ms. Frost. Okay, next up, Kyle Kelly. Hey all, uh, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm revising my comments, I'll be really quick. Uh, I just wanna say that I support the staff's alternative recommendation. Uh, the, on, the only thing that I would possibly update, uh, instead of uh, saying that you're gonna advance discussions to rail bank, uh, to instead work constructively with Roaring Camp and other stakeholders to protect their interests and limit RTC financial exposure. Uh, that that's all for me. Thank you all so much for your time and all that you're doing for this community. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Uh, next up, Equity Transit. Hi, thank you to the staff for revising today's recommendation. I also want to ask commissioners to ensure that neither adverse abandonment nor rail banking will be included in this motion. Research indicates that rail banking is not required to build the ultimate trail as we own the line. There are billions of dollars in funds coming available through state and federal rail infrastructure grants, more than have seen in the past 100 years. An interim trail ensures we miss uh, these substantial funding opportunities and other cities more committed to implementing rail like Monterey will receive our hard earned tax dollars that we've already paid into these federal rail funds. And here's a letter quote from the state of California. In 2018, California State Rail Plan identified Santa Cruz Branch Line as a key facility in the corridor for providing rail service through the region while providing connections to popular destinations, including San Francisco Bay Area, et cetera. Importantly, the locally approved alternative identified in the TCAA includes rail with trail option to further expand multimodal options and enhance utilization of the corridor for passenger rail operations and a dedicated trail. And we support that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Maggie Ama. Or maybe not. Uh, okay, we'll move on then to Ryan Sarnataro. You're up. Uh, yes. Um, the uh, you know, I appreciate the report. Uh, one glaring thing that's different about that report than what could have been reported is that there was no greenway option in there. There was no cost of actually moving forward with removing all the tracks, fixing everything up, no extra fencing, uh, and properly preparing for uh, the most greenhouse gas reducing use of that corridor, which is two paved lanes of traffic. Uh, in terms of the actual uh, report, uh, it was said that uh, no trail can be built without rail banking. 
Uh, due to liability, and you just have to look at the smart train up in Marin. Um, and it was also said that Roaring Camp is going to be the reason why rail banking could be prevented for the next couple of years. So they are the impediment to a trail. Okay, next up we have Pauline Seals. Thank you, um, Chairman and Commission. I would like to point out something on page 28.7. It says, rail banking falls under the jurisdiction of the Federal Surface Transportation Board with no guarantees as to outcome. Given the severity of climate change, which has already been mentioned, given the emphasis, the very necessary emphasis on clean transportation, this may never happen. And yet, it also says on the same page, um, rail banking could take two to three years and potentially delay implementation of some rail segments. I'd like to see that not a cent gets spent investigating rail banking without very specific approval. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Anne Kaplan. Greetings, my name is Ann Kaplan and I'm a resident of Watsonville and I want to thank the RTC staff for their careful ex, um, ex, expression of the importance of rail banking for either scenario, either scenario one or two, ultimate or in, in term. There's a lot of misinformation that's circulated about rail banking being the death knell for future rail development. This, and this is inaccurate, it, I believe it's a fear tactic meant to confuse and disorient voters. So thank you to the RTC staff for clarifying that and for your excellent report and all of your hard work. Many thanks. Thank you. Okay, yes. our, our, um, we have one more speaker. We have one more hand up. I'm gonna do a last call right now for public comments. Uh, you on. folks will have one minute. Uh, and we'll, then we'll return to the commission. The uh, next speaker is no more CZU fires. Things heard from the commission today. Uh, we're not gonna make a decision. Um, preserve, reserve, further study. There, there is no freight. There's so little freight. We can't afford it. We have to end freight. You know, uh, if, if y'all were a corporation, you'd go broke with reporting like uh, uh, <clears throat> like like uh, like Guy and Cody brought today, they'd get fired and most likely sued for, tr for the appearance of trying to tank the company. Fire fishers of officials have told us we need to stay connected to the rest of the state to bring in water tankers. Were they, in were they invited today? No. The Boulder Creek fire chief got a phone call from a stranger on International Firefighters Day to tell them what's going on today on this vote, trying to end it again. I hear the same reporting every meeting from y'all. Where's the truth? Where's the accountability? It ain't hard. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Jacob Wazaki. Wazaki. Go for it. You're unmuted. Mr. Waisaki, are you prepared to speak? We can't, unfortunately, we can't hear you. Okay. Um, we will, I'm going to call on Charles Hicks. Um, Mr. Waisaki, I, hopefully you can figure out it may be an issue at your end. Um, we'll, we'll call on Charles Hicks and then return to you. Okay. Am I, am I uh, being yep. heard? Okay, great. I just wanted to, uh, first of all, like a lot of other people, thank the RTC and uh, for all of the efforts. You know, it's been kind of a, a real interesting um, 
meeting and I, I enjoy uh, all of your all of your efforts. The thing I wanted to say is I live in the hills up behind Chaminade and like many of my neighbors, we recently had our house insurance canceled. And uh, we finally found another insurance company, but almost everyone is paying double from where they were um, last year. And this is an effect of global warming and the fire problem. And so as I see it, we're gonna start getting more and more density of people trying to move down into the town area uh, and out of the hills. There's been several articles about this also. So I think that we need to be prepared and get our transportation systems in order because we're really gonna need it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, next up, uh, William Menchin. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to thank uh, Director uh, Weston and the entire RTC staff for their presentation today and would encourage the board to accept their recommendations in its entirety. Uh, I wanted to also ask that the staff spend time at some point uh, looking at precisely what was uh, brought up a little while ago of what the uh, an ultimate uh, trail would look like, as in something that actually had enough width for act, you know, proper uh, active transportation and uh, hybrid type uh, miniature vehicles, as well as a separated sidewalk. In other words, in short, the Greenway plan. Uh, also, I think that it's very important in the uh, study of rail banking to look at how that impacts the phase three highway investment, uh, specifically in how it might be a way or a strategy to uh, remove the Aptos Strangler that's posed by the pair of rail bridges there and be able to get to bus on shoulder and ideally dedicated bus transit lanes in the future on Highway 1. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Maggie Alma. All right, she already spoke. Okay, great. Hi. All right, I made it. There you so go. So I have a couple of questions. One is, um, it's my understanding. Ms. Alma, we lost you again. You're, you're muted. If you could unmute yourself. Trying to. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. So it's my understanding that there's been like only maybe 10 or 15 examples of trails that have been reverted back to um, rail after they've been rail banked. And that's all over like a thousand trails. So I'd like some clarification on that if possible. And the second question I have is it's um, from what I, I thought that what the intention was, was to remove the rails and put in a trail, to take the rails out completely and put in a trail. And um, I saw that in the presentation that Guy Preston gave, there was actually um, a reference to just leaving the rail in. So that's uh, unclear to me because if they actually are gonna take out the rails, um, they have to remove the ballast and that's really problematic. So um, thank you. Hey, thank you, Ms. Alma. Um, I'm gonna now bring it back to the commission for uh, uh, action, motion and deliberations. There are a, uh, several questions that people raised during the public comment that I'd like to get answered, but in, for the sake of making sure we maintain a quorum to vote on this, I'd like to take that first and then we can return to figuring out which questions we might be able to answer quickly for the public. Um, so I'll call on uh, Commissioner Schifrin first. Uh Thank you. I would move this uh, uh, amended staff recommendation. Second. And I have a comments on it. Uh, I think it's a, you know, it, it, it's a it's a reasonable way to move forward at this point in time. I'm not, although I heard the um, request from a few members of the public that we add additional directions on the rail banking. Uh, I understood what the staff was saying about their intentions and that satisfies me. I mean, I think that um, they want to get a resolution. I think we know that they want to get a resolution um, and they um, will, you know, I think they will in good faith work with um, um, Roaring, Roaring Camp to try to achieve that. So 
based on all of that, um, I, I, I um, would recommend that we approve the staff recommendation as uh, uh, presented. Okay, that's the second. All right. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Uh, next up, uh, Commissioner McPherson. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. I, I, I will go along with the motion, but I think it would be good. I think the staff would appreciate additional direction that um, includes language that the, the cities be responsible for cost overruns. I think that's a concern that's not specified uh, to the degree I think we should have it in a motion. I don't know if uh, that would be acceptable to Mr. Schifrin. Um, I don't have a problem with that. I mean, I don't, you know, it's, I, I what I would like to do is to bring back a, a whole discussion on maintenance because I think maintenance is a really big issue and I think we should discuss it separately. Right. But really what we're asking, you know, what's before us today is to, you know, um, um, program money. And I'm happy to add, if it's acceptable to the, uh, to the second, an added direction that, uh, you know, the, the commission, um, I don't know, we, we, we can't, you know, we, you know. We, the, bring, the, bring back the discussion on maintenance. You know, I, I, I would say what, again what you wanted, Commissioner McPherson. I mean, I don't. Okay, yeah, I, I just think it's a it could be a pressing problem. That's all that I think we should have addressed. But um, how about just adding a direction that staff return with a discussion on uh, the how to deal with cost overruns? That's a, yeah, that'd be fine. Thank you. Would that be acceptable? Is that acceptable to the maker? The uh, to the second? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Okay, uh, Commissioner Koenig. Thank you, Chair Brown. Um, yeah, to this maintenance question, um, I'd like to propose a, a little additional direction which, um, as a friendly amendment, which would be that a maintenance agreement approved by the commission will be put in place with partner agencies prior to advertising for construction for, for any future segment. So that will basically um, allow that this does come back and, and explicitly require that we get those maintenance agreements in place. Um, I'm happy to uh, add that, but I think given how long this process might be um, before we get to that point, I think we should have a discussion on um, maintenance before then. I, I would appreciate if we could just maybe direct that um, no later than September, uh, the September meeting the commission have it a full discussion on, um, you know, the, main, the, the, main, the how to deal with the maintenance costs. We have five supervisors represented here. We have representatives from all the uh, jurisdictions, the cities along the, the, the rail the segments. You know, we should be able to have a discussion with our staff and with local staff about how to resolve it. It, it is complicated, um, but I think the sooner we do it, the better it's going to be, rather than, you know, waiting until they, you know, we're ready to go to construction. I would be happy to add that if, um, in addition, uh, you would agree to uh, an additional direction that we have a discussion on maintenance, maintenance issue, issues put on our September agenda. Is that acceptable to you? That is. Is it a, are these it's two fine, additions? fine with the second. Okay, so great, thanks. And if I may, I would want to suggest one uh, additional bit of direction, again, as a friendly amendment, which is, you know, again, really related to ensuring maximum flexibility here before the vote, which is um, explicitly authorizing the grant applications for segments eight through 11 uh, for either scenario. That, but that grant application should be silent with respect to the rail line to provide maximum flexibility to implement either trail option in the future. Well, let me ask staff about that because eight through 11 are not our grant application. So, I mean, do we really have the ability to, you know, say what those grant applications should say? I mean, I think, um, from what staff was saying, the that's sort of what the what the city and the county are intending to do. But uh, I, I'm a little reluctant to add to a motion 
uh, direction uh, when, we, when we really don't have the authority to uh, make it. So Guy, could you respond to that, please? Well, we'll ultimately have to reach an agreement with the city, um, um, a cooperative agreement um, for them to receive the money. And so at that time we could, we don't like the project that they um, won money for, we could not provide our funding. So it is important that the city hear this and I'm glad that the city's engineer, uh, the project manager is listening. Um, um, you know, we, you know, they can really do whatever they want, um, but they're, they, they would be taking risk that it might not be approved. Um, so, you know, I would hope that the, that the city staff heard, heard the need to, to make sure that flexibility be included. Uh, we could provide that direction so that they understand what the intentions are. But there's um, the only hammer would be the, the future cooperative agreement uh, to actually provide the funding. This is just the program of funds. I'd be willing to add, uh, you know, as a friendly amendment, uh, direction that staff provide the, uh, the city and the county with their recommended language for moving forward with the grant applications. Uh, it seems to me that that's reasonable. I, I, I'm reluctant to go beyond that. Is that acceptable to you? That, that yeah, that works for me. Is that acceptable to the sec the seconder? I'm just going to express my reluctant acceptance of it because I think people need to recognize the fragile nature of this compromise being proposed here, and it's getting kind of like tenuous on one side of it here. So, oh, well, yes, my answer is I, yes. But I, I guess I don't see it that way. I mean, from my perspective, it's consistent with the overall approach that we want to provide at this point in time, the through um, the grant applications, through the programming, the ability to move forward with either option. And so and, 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 yeah, and I, I think that that's I don't I don't if I so I don't see that weakens the position that we're taking by approving the staff recommendation. It's just formalizing what the executive director said before in terms of uh, a suggestion for how the, the city and the county could word their grant application to allow for that flexibility. That's why you have my reluctant acceptance of it. <laughs> okay. That, that's everything from me, thank you. Okay. Uh, so um, let's see, uh, Commissioner Rockin. It looks like you're. Yeah, I have. I only have really brief comment. I, I really want to thank staff for the alternative recommendation. It shows a great responsiveness to a lot of concerns from the public uh, on the issue of um, rail banking. And uh, I understand the concerns about rail banking, um, but my view is that what actual what rail banking actually means is precisely something that could be negotiated with Roaring Camp and others. I am certain that Roaring Camp is not going to agree to a, something that includes adverse abandonment, for example. Um, and so um, it's very possible that we could get a rail banking agreement that does more to protect the future possibilities of rail than some other agreement about rail banking might have in it. So I'm quite open to the idea that our staff would talk with Roaring Camp to try and figure out how we could provide uh, if, there's, if we're going to get to rail banking, something that would pres uh, preserve my concerns about the not having a sort of legal right to bring back rail, but no feasible practicality of it happening. So uh, that's why I don't want to change the language uh, generally that's in the staff recommendation. Um, I think it, it meets, meets the needs that we have out there and um, the way that it's worded. Um, I also think that um, people's desire to sort of make it so abstract, you know, let's talk about preserving our financial limit, recognizing our financial limitations and Roaring Camp's uh, concerns about whatever. If you make it totally abstract, it's not clear what we sort of recommend or allowed staff to kind of talk about. And I think the issue is about rail banking. It's a question of what kind of rail banking. That's a totally open-ended question. But I think the current language around rail banking is appropriate even for those that are quite concerned that rail banking of the wrong kind might, you know, and destroy all possibility of future rail service or something. But I don't think the language we have now in any way leads to that. So I'm happy with the current uh, formulation by, by Guy Preston of the 
alternative recommendation. That's my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to, I see that uh, our um, Deputy uh, Director uh, Nathan Wynn is here, and it, it, I think I, I want to give you an opportunity to just uh, jump in because I, it's probably in response to some of the conversation. So I'll call on you next uh, before I go back around to uh, Commissioner Parker. I appreciate that, uh, Chair Brown. Nathan Wen, City Engineer for the City of Santa Cruz. Um, I just wanted to, you know, jump in and um, you know talk about our ATP grant application and what the City of Santa Cruz right now, kind of the funding that we have for segments eight and nine, and the timeline uh, that we're under, the gun that we're under right now for the current funding. So, you know, we're, we are proposing to uh, approve both the um, interim and ultimate. Uh, schematic plans at our next meeting, but then also uh, you know, move forward with proceeding with final plans for the ultimate shelf configurations for segments eight and nine. And that's so that we can apply for that ATP cycle six uh, construction grant that uh, we've been talking about and that we almost got in ATP cycle five. Now, the program itself is to deliver on a trail. And if things, decisions that come, uh, things change in the next you know, six months or years ahead, um, there is that possibility of going back to the CCC if we are awarded that grant to, uh, you know, then proceed with a different, uh, the interim trail. But of course, we'd have then have to um, proceed with getting some final plans and specs for that design. But what uh, I, we support the alternative recommendation that you have today, because it does provide for that ultimate flexibility. So while we're applying, the city is going to likely apply for ATP cycle six with the ultimate shell configuration. It does not necessarily preclude, um, again, if future decisions um, dictate, you know, interim trail uh, switching to that type of design. So I just wanted to be clear with that, you know, as far as our intentions and that uh, we appreciate, again, the collaboration effort that we've had with RTC staff. We are working on getting our maintenance agreements up to date. And so we you know, look forward to bringing that back to you guys in the future. Thanks. Sandy? Sorry, um, Commissioner Parker, you're up. <laughs> okay, I didn't want to talk before you said so. Um, okay, I needed a clarification, and uh, I don't know who that's going to come from, but uh, appreciations to the RTC staff with their flexibility and how they produce this uh, for us. Um, I, I have a clarification between cost overruns versus maintenance costs, because I'm looking at segment seven, phase two. And I see that uh, the cost overrun is approximately 2.15 million. And the city's going to try to cover 1 million of it, the city of Santa Cruz, with the, the ATP grants and city funds. And then they're asking for an additional 1.15 million from the RTC. Is that correct? Am I reading that right? Yeah, uh, Nathan here again. Yeah, that's mostly correct. We, you know, we were funded uh, up to 8.6 million with the ATP grant. The, the project came in roughly about 10% over. And so we are uh, working with your staff and you guys here requesting a, basically a cost sharing as far as the overrun for segment seven phase two. Okay, that, that's what I want to know. And um, Director uh, Schifrin, uh, is that what you were talking about uh, when you were talking about cost overruns and maintenance, like coming back with future maintenance or is that something? No, um, you know, each project may or may not have cost overruns. What, but what I think staff has been talking about is the long-term um, cost of maintaining the trail once it's built. Okay. And who's going who's gonna to pay for that? And at this point, it, because it could be a very significant drain on the uh, Measure D funding and could prevent uh, uh, construction of some of the segments. So what I hope, what I'm, what the motion um, would bring back is a, is a, you know, more detailed discussion uh, about what the options are, with maybe recommendations that the commission could make to the jurisdictions about what they would prefer. We would prefer. Okay, and uh, I appreciate that. That's that's just further clarification. That's kind of what I thought. But I, I also worry about this because the bridge in Faro that supposedly Cadillac would have been 1.5 million to improve, I mean to fix at its most Cadillac uh, version, and, and we're kind of quibbling over whether the basics is even good enough. And I see the RTC now allocating 1.15 million additionally 
to the city of Santa Cruz. And I'm a little bit, you know, I'm thinking South County is just not getting some of the things that they need for this. And maybe the city of Santa Cruz is getting a little bit more. So uh, I, I just want to make that comment as we look at this and uh, understand this is a part of, of what we're deciding today. So um, thank you once again, uh, Nathan, for your uh, answers uh, from the city of Santa Cruz. And um, I appreciate, once again, uh, Guy, your staff, and what you've put together today. Thank you. Um, Director Preston, did you want to respond directly to that? Well, I need some clarification now based on uh, Commissioner Schifrin's response to Commissioner Parker's question, because the friendly amendment was actually made by Commissioner Koenig to um, not include cost overruns, which is different from maintenance. Um, so um, I, I need Commissioner Koenig, I think, to clarify whether this friendly amendment um, was uh, one, the other, or both. <laughs> My friendly amendment was in regards to maintenance agreements and having those in place. Thank you for that. Let me, uh, uh, while you got the mic, uh, Guy, has the commission provided funding for the segments in Watsonville? Uh, we provided uh, uh, $2.8 million, I believe. I'd have to go back and look, but I, I'm pretty sure my recollection is correct on that. Um, for uh, segment 18 of the rail trail. Um, however, when um, segment 18-1 had cost overruns during construction, the city of Watsonville covered those costs. Okay, so since you have the microphone, uh, Director Schifrin, I, I just wanted to ask that. So uh, the cost overruns, was that paid by the RTC? If what you just said was true, then the answer would be no. That is what I just said. It is Excellent. Cost well, there are cost money. overruns. I mean, Thank we're you. using it in two different situations. One is where the bid comes in above the engineer's estimate, which is the case with segment seven. The other is once construction happens, the bid's accepted, and then there are additional costs that were unanticipated. Let me just say, I mean, my sense is the commission has tried to help every jurisdiction as it's moved forward with the um, implementing the the rail the the rail trail segments, um, it's been supportive of the county. It's been supportive of the city of Santa Cruz, and it's been supportive of the city of Watsonville when asked. So, I mean, I, I don't remember any time the commission has turned down a request from any jurisdiction uh, at the commission for additional funding. Well, and I appreciate that, Director Schifrin. I just, uh, we're talking about trying to maintain all this and trying to maintain our budget with RTC and, uh, you know, people being responsible for things. That's that's all I brought up. Uh, I just wanted to be, uh, you know, uh, an awareness of it for the public to, to see where these funds are going. So that's it. Thank you very much, though, Guy, for your clarification. Yeah. If I may, I'm, I'm just going to, I want to try to bring us back around to the item that we are deliberating and voting on right now. Um, and just to stay focused, we will certainly have uh, many conversations about uh, the broader distribution of funding, uh, you know, formulaic versus uh, RTC granted measure defunds for among jurisdictions. Um, I, I'd just like to, to try to get through this item. Uh, yes. Commissioner Hurst. Do you have comments? And then I'll yes, give the I, mic to yes, thank Director you. Preston. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. You know, I get a little nervous when we uh, have this gradual creep toward uh, rail banking and shifting the cost uh, of uh, the RTC maintenance as well as the uh, programmatic uh, changes and stuff back on the on the backs of cities. You know, the the RTC does own this facility does own this line and we've been given guidance as to how to use it when we when we requested and received uh, 116 monies and so I think we're kind of moving away from uh, where our intent was originally and everybody wants a, a certainly a piece of the action 
And everybody really, I think, wants rail, trail, and bridge equity. And I don't know if we're getting that. I think that we can we can have more discussions about it. But I'm concerned about the gradual creep here that we're moving for, forward to uh, rail banking and other other scenarios that um, uh, actually may cost the public a, a lot more money and yield less results. I'll yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Okay, Director Preston, you have some comments? Yeah, I got some clarification from staff that we did provide some additional funding to Watsonville um, when estimates did come in high. But during construction, when um, there were utility complex associated with a water line, we did not. So it was a combination of both. Um, so now we're providing additional uh, funding to the city of Santa Cruz when their bids came in high. Um, I must say there's an awful lot of utilities on that job. Um, and, and, and so if there is an additional need for funding, um, staff may come back and make a recommendation or not. Um, uh, for for additional costs during construction, um, uh, based on uh, today's discussion, that was uh, to not include any sort sort of language regarding cost overruns at this time. Um, all the questions. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Let's not, so we don't have to have two votes. Come on. No, I didn't mean to call for. No, you. I'm calling the chair to call the question. Thank you. Okay, I, we will now. Um, we will now. It looks like we're ready to take a vote on the motion, um, and so I'll ask for a, a roll call. Before yeah, doing that, I just want to be motion? clear um, whether somebody has written down all these amendments so that we can be clear what the motion is. I didn't write them down. The meeting, the meeting's recorded, so staff could take them off of the recording, maybe. We've been writing them down, and there, the motion would be to adopt the resolution with the alternative uh, recommendations provided by the executive director, along with the additional changes that have been identified, and we have been keeping track of them. Okay, are, are uh, commissioners comfortable with the motion as it stands and the kind of summary or, or just the, the gist of what those amendments are related to the item. So what what happens, this is uh, Commissioner Hernandez, what happens if there is no negotiations with, with Roaring Camp or they don't they don't fall through? Uh, okay. what's well, that if, if, if you give the metaphor, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. <laughs> yeah. It will come back to us. We'll hear all about it. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm going to now uh, ask for a roll call <laughs> vote um, for on this item. Commissioner Bertrand? I approve. Commissioner Sandy Brown? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Aye. Commission Alternate Hearst? No. Commission Alternate Hernandez? No. Commission Alternate Schifrin? Aye. Commission Alternate Quinn? Approved, yes. Commissioner Koenig? Aye. Commissioner McPherson? Yes. Commissioner Br uh, Kristen Brown? Aye. Commissioner Parker? Yes. And Commissioner Rockin. Aye. That passes with two no's. All right. Um, so before we move on to our before uh, we final... um, before we I... leave this item, I would like to say, given my, the exchange I had with uh, Commissioner Parker, that um, thus far, the, all the commissioners have worked together cooperatively on moving forward with these rail segments and. I, I know uh, all the North, North County commissioners have supported the projects in the South County and all the South County commissioners have supported 
the projects in the North County. And I'm hoping that we will continue to really look at this as a countywide effort. And as the various jurisdictions get ready to implement segments within their jurisdiction, that the commission will do as much as it possibly can to support those efforts. All right, um, thank you for that. I also have some uh, comments to make before we move on from this item. There were questions that were raised by members of the public. We tried to answer those um, as we can. And so I just wanted to get these out here and um, ask if staff could just provide clarification. I, I, I know the answers to some, but I wanna make sure the public is aware and that we're being responsive. Um, so, um, Be the, before the, you do that, um, yeah. Madam Chair, uh, yes. I have to teach this afternoon, so I, am, I need to apologize for leaving the meeting. I, um, I don't think uh, Commissioner Coonerty is available to come in, um, and I'm sorry I have to leave, but this other obligation is mandatory. Yes, um, understood. I also have, I'm actually teaching cl my classes online right now next to me and they have a written assignment they're doing. So I understand we all need to get moving. Um, so anyone who has to leave, the rest of our items are not um, action items. They are uh, um, reports. We do need to maintain a quorum for this meeting to continue. Um, but I did wanna just try to get those three questions answered very quickly. Um, and I'll do that before I call on anybody else, okay? Just one moment, please. Um, if the staff, there was a comment made that um, we could potentially be at risk of losing funding if we um, you know, don't move forward with the um, approved, locally uh, approved alternative. Are there any particular funds that we are currently at risk of losing if we do not take action to move forward now? I am not aware of any funding that for thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, in terms of this question about a clarification on what commitments have been met for the first seven miles, can we get some kind of like a memo or just a, a quick overview, maybe circulated so that we can um, respond to questions from the public about that? I just like to make sure because there are people who still aren't can you know want to want to understand this better. Is that something that could be done? Kind of sure. Offline? We provided notice to uh, Progressive Rail back in August. Um, uh, we've had conversations with them. They even told us to, that, that there's equipment on the track that needs to be moved. So uh, we've not heard anything from Progressive Rail that, that we have not met our commitments. Um, and, and it's been, um, we're, we're getting close to a year from now. Um, and um, in fact, we plan on writing them a letter that they're not maintaining that section properly now. It's, it's getting overgrown. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, there was a question about the uh, concerns about the estimated cost for interim versus ultimate uh, configurations that the interim was only for part of the trail, but the ultimate was for the full trail. And so the there was a disparity potentially on the cost because there are more miles in the ultimate. Um, can you just clarify on that? Um, There's actually more miles on the interim because it includes the county trestle. Um, otherwise, it's a like-for-like -like comparison. Um, uh, the cost estimates only go down to Rio Del Mar um, um, at the end of second 12. So it's pretty much an apples to apples comparison. Thank you. I, I just wanted to make the, sure that was clear for the public that it is uh, apples to apples. Uh, at least as close as we can get on that. Um, okay, those were the questions I had heard from members of the public. Um, so we will now, um, I'm gonna close this item and we will go back to our, uh, <laughs> the rest of our agenda. We have uh, the, the final items we have are items 23, commissioner or reports. I'm hoping if commissioners have any, they will keep them very brief. Uh, Commissioner Koenig. Thank you, Chair Brown. Um, I just had a question. So um, I had posed some questions um, to uh, RTC Council and Commissioner Schifrin had as well. Uh, those were answered to the commission in private as a confidential memo. Um, and I just wanted to, uh, I, mean, I don't know exactly what the process for this, maybe RTC Council uh, Mattis can, can clarify, but uh, request to the commission that those be allowed to be made public. 
since that was the intention by asking the, the clarifying questions to begin with. So Madam Chair, the, the memos were provided to the commission as uh, confidential communications. If the commission wished to authorize their release, the commission should provide that direction to the to the staff and, and my office. And that can be would, done through a motion. Would now be an appropriate time to do or, that. Would you remind me what we're doing before I authorize it? So there, there were two memos that the council, that the commission received this week. One was a series of responses to questions that Vice Chair Koenig had asked uh, in relation to the current Measure D and RTC. And then okay. Commissioner Schifrin. I remember, I remember that one, thank you. Yeah, and then Commissioner Schifrin separately asked questions about it as well too. And what we responded to were both sets of questions. Okay, I remember this both now, and I, I think there's no problem putting those out in the public, but let's put it to a question, I guess. I move we put those, make them public. Second. Okay, any discussion on that? All right, let's vote before we lose another member. <laughs> we can't take, can't take any action. Um, uh, so um, I guess we'll take a roll call on the motion to make that information available to the public that was received. Commissioner Bertrand? I approve. Commissioner Sandy Brown? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Left. Commissioner uh, Alternate Hurst? Aye. Commission Alternate Hernandez? Aye. Uh, Commission Alternate Quinn? Okay, Commissioner Koenig? Aye. Commissioner McPherson? Aye. Commissioner Kristen Brown? Aye. Commissioner Parker? Aye. And Commissioner Rotkin? Aye. That passes. All right. Uh, so we'll now move on to the director's report. I will make two very quick announcements. Uh, we put out a press release uh, regarding the repairs at Manresa Beach and why we're not moving forward with them at this time. And it is related to a uh, a con ongoing conversation with the Coastal Commission regarding the need for a coastal development permit um, at that location. In fact, we had a very productive meeting yesterday and um, we're gonna continue to move forward to, to making sure that that area of the rail line is protected uh, this year and that we ultimately get a project uh, moved forward um, that's more permanent. And then uh, last uh, but not least, uh, um, RTC was notified that the timber trestle on the Santa Cruz Branch Trail line um, uh, uh, caught on fire um, early in the mor morning, Monday, May 2nd. Uh, the trestle is located at milepost 0 0.86 uh, near Pajaro Junction in Monterey County, just south of the Pajaro River Bridge. Um, RTC staff contacted both Progressive Rail and Loring Camp, who are who are also notifi notified and is in the process of assessing the damage. Uh, Roaring Camp has arranged for an engineering assessment of the bridge, but unfortunately freight rail and Watsonville will be out of service until repairs can be completed. That concludes my report. Thank you, Director Preston. Uh, are there any questions for Director Preston? Thank you. All right, um, that we will move on to our uh, last item, or certainly not least, our Caltrans report, and we have, uh, I believe you are, you're still here, Mr. Olenek? Yes, yes, there you are. Uh, thank you for your patience. Um, you it bet. is time for your report. You bet. Uh, John Olenek, Caltrans District 5, glad to be here today. I'll be brief as well. Essentially, we are still really appreciative of the, kick, the uh, groundbreaking event we had for the Highway 17 uh, Wildlife Crossing uh, Project. And I'm only bringing that up to mention that we are going to do our part to uh, get the project done as soon as we can. I think we're looking at a towards the end of November timeline, which is a little advanced in schedule. That's kind of our current estimate. We are going to do our best to mitigate any traffic concerns by uh, keeping uh, the, the peak hours, the, the activity to a, a, a low, a low you know, activity during peak hours. Any significant changes in staging, we're going to attempt to do that at night again so as not to impact traffic. But also, I just wanted to mention for all of us, for your constituents, please remind everyone to mind the construction speed limits. It is an active construction zone, uh, which leads me to my second point in that this week, 
we held our District 5 Worker Memorial Ceremony here at our district office in of San Luis Obispo, just to remind uh, uh, all those who participated uh, of the seriousness of working on the highway. And uh, and so we, we that's an event we hold every year and it's uh, very important to us and to all of our respective public works agencies and our contractors who work in, in serious conditions on the highway. So again, we all want to uh, pay, pay heed to the cone zone as it goes and uh, keep our eyes on our speed limits and be careful around our work zone areas. So that's my brief report for today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Olenek. Uh, are there any questions for Caltrans rep? Okay, with that and having heard that we um, have, uh, uh, we will not have item 30, a closed session today. Um, I believe we are uh, done with our regular business and I will adjourn today's meeting. Thank you. We came in just under 2 p.m. Not bad. <laughs> hey, hey, excellent job of cheering, Sandy. Thank you so much. It's Thanks. not easy. People, Thanks. public has to understand how difficult that is. Thank you. Well, thanks everybody for uh, being uh, being here and being succinct here, especially towards the end. Uh, see you next time. Our next meeting is going to be June 2nd, I believe, which is the first Thursday in June. Uh, see you then.